Hello, everybody. Welcome to another TFE Live. This is our show number 212 for the 20th of August, 2019. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. We have live in studio today a very special guest. Uh, first, we have Julia, as usual, there on the left. Hello, Julia. Hello. I trust you're well. I am. And um, we slid you to the left a little bit. I'll put your title up there, our coordinating, our loyal, trustworthy, reliable. Well-paid. Well-paid coordinating producer. <laughs> and money. next to her is our special guest is Marcus Fentner. Marcus, welcome. Hello, Tom. Nice to have you here. Uh, you've been on the road for how long? Uh, one and a half months now, another oh, month to go. Bloody hell. <laughs> what brings you to San Francisco? Uh, we have an event this weekend here at St. Francis Yacht Club, North American Championships. And I thought it would be nice if you're around to, to say hello, put a name to the face. So well, yeah. that was nice of you to do that. And we'll have Marcus on for the entire show. He says he doesn't have more pressing business, at least for the next couple hours. And maybe we can do it in less than that. I hope so. But you never know, because we have a lot of interesting topics today. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Tom Eamon. Okay, let's get out of this and get on to our first slide, which is our upcoming guests. We've got quite a list here coming along. Not only do we have Marcus today from, uh, from Germany, so originally from Germany, from Berlin, I guess, and now living in Greece. Is that right, Marcus? Yeah, You're living correct. in Athens? Yeah, better weather than Germany. <laughs> Better weather. I'm not not so sure. It was it was pretty hot, hot this year in the north of Europe. So. How, how, about, how about taxation? How's the taxation? Uh, about what? Taxation. What? <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. No, no double taxes. No, no double taxes. No, but no, we're delighted. Germany. Delighted to have. Well, we lived in Germany for eight years, so I can appreciate the tax regime there. Yeah, pretty, at, least, at least you understand it there. In Greek, I have no idea how it works, so I keep it in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> it's better. And Julia's late husband, Conrad, was right. German. And Julia, we, the other day, I had to take her to the bank so she could get something notarized for the German, uh, what was Social that, Social Security. Pension. Yeah. Social Security. They have to prove that I'm alive. <laughs> so she can get her <laughs> husband's continuing pension, which is great. But we have Marcus with us live in studio today. Delighted to have him here. And on Friday, it's Patrick DeBarros. Patrick, who is a longtime friend and a tower of power. He's written a, a, a biography, autobiography, and uh, we're going to talk about his book, but we're going to talk about his life, Into the Wind, is the title of his book. And on uh, Tuesday, next Tuesday, a week from today, Commodore Phil Lotz of the New York Yacht Club, he's the immediate past Commodore, updating us on the IC-37s the Invitational Cup by Malgus 37s. I'm quite not sure what the name is, whether whether it's that. I see 37s anyway. And we'll have uh, Commodore Lotz on. And then on a week from this Friday, we'll have Luca Devoti. Uh, Luca, the long time, the sil f silver medalist in the Finn class in Sydney in 2000. And a Finn builder and a longtime friend. He's been on the show once before, always full of humor, full of life, uh, and full of opinion. So we'll be delighted to have him as well. I want to thank, of course, Jody Shields, who was on with us live from Australia, from Wanji Wanji. We have learned to pronounce that, right, Julia? Correct. And he was a hoot as well. And he, of course, is the Sail GP commentator. If you haven't seen that show, it's on our Sailing Illustrated Facebook page, like all of the previous shows are. You can go see it there and watch a replay as same for all of our previous 100 and what 11 is this show one or sorry 212 200. yes 100 211 shows and you don't have to watch them all at once <laughs> you don't have to go on like netflix and binge watch them for no you don't that would that that would be mental masochism it would yes if ever there was okay i thought we before we get to marcus and uh, we're going to get updates from him on the state of the kite kiting, kite boarding world and the Olympics 2024 and all the things that are going on. But before we do that, I promised Jody Shields last Friday we'd run this video about the Sail GP Inspire program. And I found the video and I thought you'd enjoy this. Have a look. What's your favourite pastime? Uh, to swim and stream video games. I like riding. Play video games. Free time on my phone, you know. Singing, dancing and acting. 
gymnastics and that, on the trampoline. And sailing? No. 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 Not really. No, never have. We're an island and you would you would assume that all of the young people here on the island and all the people here have access to the beach and sailing, but that's just not the case. About a third of young people, children on the island, are living in poverty. Only so, so few of them have actually had an opportunity to ever be out on the water. So the work that UKSA does in providing these type of opportunities and having partners like SailGP that support it is so, so important. Who wears their best? Come on, guys. So SailGP is launching this brand new initiative called SailGP Inspire. And the whole idea is to reach out to the local community at every stopover that we go to, focus on three modules, learning, careers, and racing. Look at the bigger boat coming out. Can you see which way the wind's coming from? Today we're starting with the learning programme and what we're doing here is trying to look into the science behind sailing. Before we take these students on the water, we want them to know exactly what's going on. Sailing geometry, how a sail works, how a boat floats. Then once they've kind of got their base knowledge, we'll take them afloat on these RS Cat 14s and give them a whale of a time. <laughs> Later in the day, we're actually going to have six skippers, which is just incredible, taking all these local sailors out sailing, and they'll be doing some warm-up training and then finishing the day off with a race. So what's going to happen is we're going to have six special guests come to meet you guys. The skippers of each team are going to come sailing with you guys this morning. Oh, look, look you're nervous. And what's wrong with you? <laughs> Sailing is an amazing sport for teaching lifelong lessons that young people could apply for whatever they do in life. Teamwork, sportsmanship, things like being well prepared, things like being responsible. Amazing finish, lots of nose dives, lots of sailors, big smiles. Okay, so you get the idea. This is an offshoot from what was done here in San Francisco for the America's Cup 2013 that was actually run by Laurent Esquier. And also uh, what was done in Bermuda with that program. This gentleman, uh, Tom Herbert Evans, I think is his name. Uh, I've not met him, but we've been texting. He's going to come on the show and explain more about it because I think it's a great initiative for the sport. I love to see Larry and Russell doing this sort of thing. And congrats to them and to their sponsors, RS Sailing and Wasp and Rooster and Mark Set and so on, UKSA, because it's it's good for the sport. It can't be. I, it can only be. Don't you don't you agree, Julia, Marcus? What do you think? Oh yes, it's a great opportunity to get in youth involved with sort of hands on operate opportunity. I mean, Marcus, you see this all over the world. You're traveling literally all over the world all the time with running kite kiting, kiteboarding. How do we get kids from, you heard them all say, oh, I'm really not a sailor. How do we get kids from this level into club sailing and beyond and maybe even into the Olympics? Well, first, first to attract them to sailing at all is the challenge. Now it's not like 20 years ago anymore where, you know, sport clubs and, um, and things like that were the only thing that people or kids can do. Now we have to compete against mobile phones and video games and um, the kids are hardly moving anymore. So I think any initiative that gets the kids out and get them into nature and in the water is great. And I think the trick is really to to make it fun for them, to make it an enjoyable day with with the heroes of our sport and make them want to go and not just their parents sending them to sail because mm. that's not going to work. Mm. Then they will go somewhere else. If they want to do it themselves, that's how we get them. Are, are there any similar initiatives in kiting? Is it kite? What do you call it? Kiteboarding? Kiting? Kiteboarding. 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 Yeah. Any Kite similar boarders. initiatives? Um, it's it's a little bit different. Just, uh, it's a different pathway. It's not really coming from the yacht clubs. Um, it's coming from, there's a lot of crossover from other board sports, skateboarding uh, and all of that. And people are doing it. They're learning it in the holidays on, on the beaches somewhere in a hotel and have fun with it. They, they start as a fun activity and not with, with racing in their mind or with competing in their mind. And then only a small fraction is crossing over to, to competition later on. It was a was an interesting experience two weeks ago in the Indian Ocean Island Games. 
the team from the Maldives, um, they can hardly have a laser because mm. they are spread out over 1,200 islands. Mm. And even if they have one on one island, whom do you compete against? Mm. Um, but they came with brand new windsurfing and kite equipment, uh, which they have in the hotels on the beaches, which are paid by the tourists and, and the locals benefit from it. So I think that's considering how can we get people on board and why not through tourism? Interesting. Cool. Okay. Well, tell us what brings you to San Francisco. I have this slide up that I pulled off the website of the 2019 Formula Kite class. What is going on here this week? Yeah, so San Francis uh, has been one of the birthplaces of, of kiteboard racing. Um, I know 2006 or five or even earlier. Do you, do you remember, Julia, when that really got off the ground? I so don't. To speak? I talked to John Gomes this morning. I should have asked him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know John Gomes? Who's... Yeah, John Gomes was one of our first executive committee member. Yeah. Uh, 2008. He often stays here at the Beach Street Yacht Club. He's now living, you know, he's living in Frankfurt. In oh, no, I didn't Deutschland. Know. Ah, yeah. no. Right. Because yes. he right. told me he wanted to come over to, to a meeting, but then yes. it didn't work out. Yeah. Yep. Right. Yeah, so it's one of the iconic places for, for kiteboard racing. And we haven't been here for a long time. I think 2012 we were here with the competition the last time. And I'm really happy that we have the North American Championships here this week. Now, what is this other thing that's it's the Hydrofoil Pro Tour, which we've had here in the past? And that's also listed on here, but that looks like a sub-event of this. Is, is that part of this? And what's the Hydrofoil Pro Tour? It is. There's basically three different circuits. The one is the Formula Kite class, which is now the Olympic equipment, mm -hmm. um, which has pretty strict equipment regulations, number of equipment, uh, measurement, like like any other boat class as well. And then there's two open tours. The one's the Kite for World Series, which we organize, and then there's the Hydrofoil Pro Tour, which uh, has started a couple of years ago um, from a bunch of riders that are doing a couple of events. And... <sighs> Um, yeah, we are happy about basically every event that's taking place where people have the opportunity to compete and to train. And so because it has been here over the last years, we joined forces this year and do it combined. Cool. Okay, so let's play a video that I picked off the web here, off the internet, and it's from a local, I'm not sure who took it, but it's racing here on San Francisco Bay. And is a lot of these hydrofoil pro tour guys, a lot of these, these kite boarders have been here. Riders, we call them, right? Is that the, is that the term of art now is rider? <laughs> whatever you want. No, no, no what, it's whatever you want. <laughs> no, it's, I mean, from, from board sports, it's coming riders, but they, they more and more, they, they consider them as sailors. Don't okay. worry about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And there's a lot of crossover. We can talk about that <laughs> later on. Okay, we, we should. We uh, yes. will. Yeah. But the point is, this was taken by someone here locally, and I'm not sure who, showing just, it's a very quick video, and it's showing what's going on on San Francisco Bay, as a lot of the sailors have already fronted up. I'll leave the mics up if you want to comment. Already fronted up to practice. This is, this is almost, uh, I think, 10 days ago. Yeah, so it's there's there's happen there's kite racing happening here all the time, and uh, I think there's a Thursday night race series in San Francis, um, and yeah, some of the first world champions were coming from San Francis Yacht Club, the Heineken uh, siblings. Um, so there's there's racing every week uh, around the Cairns, and um, yeah, it gets more and more people are coming early to the events, train, and spend time on the water especially here in san francisco we need to know the place uh to sail well is this about the windiest venue there is uh we had it quite for, for regular racing you know not down in tenerife in the south of spain or some of these other places uh, we had it quite windy in uh, in marseille we had it quite windy in paracas at the pedal games last week down down in Peru. yeah it was like 30 30 plus wow so but yeah this is a windy venue here. So they expect it to be windy. They like it. And I, I tell you, Julia can vouch for this. We really enjoy the kiters, the kite, the, the riders. <laughs> I don't know why I call them kiters, but the, the kite, kiters. No, nah, go with riders or sailors. Okay, or... riders or sailors. I promise not to say kiters. I promise not to say <laughs> kiters again. <laughs> Good luck. Ever again. But we enjoy having at yeah, St. Absolutely. Francis, and you're right, they're just like any other fleet. On Wednesday, the old, the Woodies sail, the, the traditional one designs, the Canars, the IODs, and so on. And then on Thursdays, the 
the, the riders, <laughs> sail. sailors, kiteboarders, the, the kiteboarders, <laughs> the kiteboarders sail, and they come in, and it is well, Julia will vouch for me. It's a hoot, and the, the oh, bar yeah. fills up. We all hang out, yes. and of course, I've gotten to know some of them because my daughter Meg's boyfriend has, was a former Tyree, is a former pro kiter, and so we've gotten to know him as well. And it, it is a nice atmosphere, isn't it, Julia? It is, and it adds a lot of vim and vigor to the club. And diversity, too, because Absolutely. you get people from all walks of life, young and old, and yep. not just a bunch of old white men and women like we have normally at St. Francis, although it's one of the most diverse clubs in the world, probably. And it really works out when uh, when once once the fleet is integrated. It's a little bit chicken and egg situation, so we are very happy about every yacht club that is uh, putting up um, Thursday nights, Wednesday nights, whatever racing, and then the fleet is coming and joining the club, and uh, just like everyone else, uh, it's just because you it's so easy and transportable. You just go to the beach, pick up, and and go. Um, it's a yeah, as I said, chicken and egg situation. If there's an offering by the club, then people will come. If not, then say, well, no, why is no one coming? So it's a little bit tricky, mm. but we're getting there. Well, and you didn't mention Daniela Moros, whom we are very proud of here. She's just won again. I think we'll see a video in a second of her at, at La Garda where she won the yeah. the world's first time. Set this, see this video that's here. Uh, set this video up for us, and then I'll run that. Yeah, so we had uh, the worlds in La Garda, one of the another iconic place. Um, we had yes. a little bit crazy weather, mm. one day with fifty knots, one day with snow wind, but um, it was a great regatta. And the uh, special thing about it was that we had uh, the first, we talked about the last time I was on your show, um, about how it, would, how it would like in theory to run a relay. And so we did it the first time there as a test on one afternoon. Uh, 22 teams, 12 countries, so not a bad turnout for, for a first test. And that's how it could look like. There's some. Say that again. How many teams from how many countries? Uh, Twenty-two teams, twelve countries. And tell us again about the relay. It's a man and a woman. And how does the? It's, yeah. not, it's not a baton, but how do you hand off the figurative baton? So basically, what we did, we split them into eleven per start. So and did a little bit of a round robin, not really balanced, but um, more or less fair. And eleven start. So let's say all the men start do one lap come around and then there's a changeover zone below the com committee boat. Basically, the one is coming from the one side full speed and the other partner, the second partner, is coming from the other side full speed. And the one on the first lap has to cross the line first and then the other one goes. We had two, or two OCS, so the timing is getting better. That what needs to be trained. You will see it in the video that sometimes uh, the timing is not right yet. But if you have a closing speed of 60 knots, then <laughs> the timing, you know, you have to train that. <laughs> there, there's a little yes. bit more to it than just waiting there and going. So. Okay, so this is from Lake Garda. It's the first time you've had a high-level test of this relay, I guess. Yeah. You, know, you presented this video at the mid-year meeting of World Sailing Correct, yeah. in May. So let's have a look at it. Is, is basically it's normal wind what lured forces. The, the only thing is the changeover. So that's the line between the mark and the boat. We saw that was there was one two seconds in between. So that needs some training. 
Um, but we had really... So, so they start on one side of the boat and finish on the other? How does it... No, they do a normal up and start. Yes. Um, yeah, standard. And then they come on the reach on port into the changeover line and the second one is starting on starboard cool um over the line which also solves all the right of way let's listen problems Where's Evan from? I don't know him. Uh, I think well, is he from San Diego. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, but it was interesting that even the ones that were a little bit skeptical in the beginning, um, and the ones that only came out watching and seeing what's happening, um, were really, really fascinated and, and amazed how it works. And it's are, are you happy? Yeah, I mean, we were we were super happy. Everyone, I was on the start boat on that day. And we, we allowed the coaches all to come in to come close and even go a little bit in the course area because we, we said we are in this together. We have to develop this and we want to have feedback. So we had a we had a long meeting before, went through everything and did it. And then we had a feedback session afterwards on a couple of small things that we that we are adjusting. Uh, but everyone was really, really stoked on, on how it works and uh, the options that you have. With it. It's not only the racing. You're adding a lot of tactical things mm -hmm. before the start. So you can imagine even some match racing between mm -hmm. the, the second team members um, to keep each other away from the changeover area. Um, Is that there's legal? A, there's a, yeah, well, as long as you play by the rules. So they're sailing around in the pre-start area waiting for their rider. Their for kite, their team partner. Their, their team partner to come and finish. And in the meantime, you can maneuver against its other boats. Yeah, well, they can match race the other one. Wow. Really like, like everything else. Wow. It's just a little bit faster. And, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. But it's really, we had so many good comments. And, um, I mean, the, the rules that we set up for it, there's a special set of rules because you have to define from when you are racing, when is the one finishing, when is the other finishing, etc. Mm. So there's a whole rule, rule book for it. Um, but yeah, everyone was, was super, super happy with it. Speaking of which, Julia has a question from, I think, David James. Yes. Who's a friend of ours, a, a local guy who's a keen racing sailor, lives across the bay in yeah. Sausalito. Yeah. He, he served on some kite surfing protest committees. You might be interested in what constitute overlap when your sail is 90 feet in front of you. Can you explain that? Yeah, it's hull only, which sounds a bit weird because the hull is only one meter 50 long. Um, but it basically makes everything a clear head, clear stern situation. Mm -hmm. And it solves a lot of problems when you go at that speed. So the same way that um, that there's a high speed rules, especially for catamarans and uh, the M32s and GCs and whatever. Mm. Um, you make you make it a bit easier, um, just clear head, clear stern in most situations. And that solves a lot of problems. You're a traditional yachty. You're not just a kiteboarder. You grew up in traditional sailing, right? Well, my background is windsurfing, actually. Um, that's what I competed in. And yeah, while I sail in whatever I can get my hands on, unfortunately not not enough <laughs> at the moment. Mm -hmm. Let's let's stop here. I've got this beautiful shot from Lake Garda for the next video, so you can think about uh, setting that scene for us. But let me stop here and just say hi. We have so many folks on here. Steve Groover is in Connecticut. Hannah Lee Knoll, by the way, who has left or is leaving Malgus and going to work for Harkin. And she says hello from Pewaukee, so I suspect yeah. that means she's already there. Yeah. Hello to you, Hannah Lee. Hannah Knoll, Gretchen Dorian is in Harbor, beautiful Harbor. Have you ever been in Michigan? I'm from Michigan, no. the, the, yeah, the Great Lakes State, in, in the upper northwest corner of the lower peninsula, the mitten, the, the thing that looks like the, you can always tell somebody from Michigan because they put their hand up and and tell you where <laughs> this side or that side <laughs> yeah but in the upper uh, northwestern corner of the lower peninsula it's a place called harbor springs petoskey traverse city it's a beautiful part of the world not just the state uh hi to you gretchen dorian max hunt and pedro foiling sailor the ruse are up early in ozzy big breeze next two days in sydney this is peter uh steph steven stevenson Steph Stevenson, I think he pronounces it spell like Stephenson. Jack Everett is back home in Chattanooga after having an awesome trip 
to cows. Clark Chapin, double thumbs up. Thank you, Commodore Chapin. Marco from DIYC. <laughs> Bill Wingrove, hello to you. Fabian Harrelson in Sweden. Hi, Jody. It's old by now, but love the phone call video. So he, he doesn't realize that we don't have Jody on. Uh, Fabian, if you haven't seen that, that was on Skype. On, it's on Friday's show. Yeah. And you can see that on, of course, Sailing Illustrated's Facebook page. And uh, hi to our hosts as well. Thank you, Julia, Pedro, Sailor, and 15 other people. Yep, indeed, Josh Toza, the marketing manager at U.S. Sailing, the STEAM market, marketing comms director. Hello to you, Josh. Uh, Jack Everett, I saw the finish and prize giving of the Inspire race in Cows. Awesome. And Jack's a longtime veteran, keen observer of the sport and if, if he endorses it's got to be a pretty good idea i think ben nichols david james we mentioned thomas Hurwich is that is somebody you know that's a new name for us i think mm -hmm. leo versuren hello leo is in um lee rather not leo lee who is in scandahuvia i think he's northern european ted ryman pedro foiling sailor tom herbert evans is a good guy even if he is a pommy even if he's a friend <laughs> <laughs> tom herbert evans is the <clears throat> gentleman running this Inspire program for sale, GP. Uh, ben Nichols confirms that. He says, Tom Herbert Evans is amazing. He got both my daughters into sailing and many thousands more. The Pied Piper of the sailing world. So says Ben Nichols, and that's a real endorsement too. So we're going to get Tom Herbert Evans on the show sometime sooner than later, despite notwithstanding our <laughs> quite long and cool line of, of guests coming on in the next few weeks. Marcos Feinstein, how do you, Gerald? Gerard Sheridan. Hamish Ross is coming on the show, too. Hamish Ross, the America's Cup veteran, one of the only people I knew who's got a, well, he's got a Ph.D. in law, but he did his thesis on the America's Cup and the deed of gift, and he uh, sends some America's Cup trivia to us for these shows, and we're going we're gonna to ramp that up, plus get Hamish on the show. Kiwi down in Auckland live watching bill canfield the president you know must you must know yep. bill is the taylor's dad and the president of the um, u.s virgin islands sailing association is he on the council uh no no um he sometimes was. sometimes he's alternate it he's, depends. i think he's he there. Was alternate in, uh, yeah. in the media meeting for hector exactly yeah. Stuart Struley, who's the esteem. My mother says stop using the word esteem, but I don't know a better word. He is cool and smart and good. Stuart Struley is the comms director for New York Yacht Club, is watching. Christopher Beckwith. Hello, Chris. Justin Palm down south. Karen Robertson, Rick. Do you know Karen Robertson in Scotland? There's a there's oh. a gal who's really interesting. We've had her on the show, too. Manuel, Brendan Gomez. Hello. Alistair McRae, Ted Ryman in Cape Town. Karen Robinson, Robertson, of course, in Scotland. Jean-Pierre Keegan's up in Montreal. You know, you've seen his stuff. He's been on the show a couple times and written. I'm, I'm running one of your videos that you sent to me, Jean-Pierre. Uh, thank you for that, about the all the kids that are sailing in the 29er. I guess it's the Europeans that are going on. I'll, I'll run that video in a sec. Rick Rundell, I'm here to play, team. Okay, Rick, good for you. Uh and Josh Tozo's at U.S. Sailing, the HQ in Bristol. And they kind of gather around to see if I'm going to say anything snarky or nice or what about <laughs> U.S. Sailing, <laughs> having been executive director before any of them was born and before you were born, Marcus. But I still love the organization and the sport. And uh, these people are, are heart, heart and soul of the sport here in this country and work hard. Neil Collingridge, Blake Middleton. Uh, Blake Middleton cheers from Lake Minnetonka, which is up in Minnesota. A great, it's, you know, where they don't realize a lot of people – even in this country, particularly non-sailors, don't realize that the hotbed of sailing is on these small lakes, a lot of them, in Michigan, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Ohio, Texas even. We had a guy on, two guys on from Arizona, where there's not a lot of breeze. It wouldn't be probably fertile kite boarding ground, but we had a couple of our friends on from Arizona Yacht Club in from we have so many states, in the, and I mean, it's so big, it's bigger than Europe, or the same size, more or less, in 50 states, yeah, yeah. more than countries in Europe. So yeah. it's <laughs> this way, this but, way, this time around, and that's confusing why, for the Europeans. And that's why <laughs> World Sailing, we get one vote, and the and Europe got two. gets 30. Got two. Well, on the council, we get two. I <laughs> have a strong opinion on the AGM, but okay. that's probably for later. <laughs> and Europe gets 30 plus, and we get, we get one at the AGM. Hannah, we will uh, have to talk about blockheads offline, Pedro. Okay, so the blockheads is, is Harkin's initiative. And now, uh, why don't you tee us up for this video? 
which is at beautiful Lake Garda. Yeah, I think that's just uh, just from the last day if it's playing of of the of the world of the, of the worlds. It's just some some impressions. Um, we had too much wind to sail on the last day. Um, we waited until four four thirty was the last possibility, I think. Uh, but it was just too much. I mean, there were boats washed on the on the shore in the mm. marina. Mm. Um, that, that was really not fun. And the official title of this event? Uh, that was the Formula Kite World Championship for individual. So we did a, um, the mixed relay as a as a test. And next year, the, the video separate. we just saw was at the yeah, same event. That, that was the okay. same event. Yeah. Let's have a look, and then we'll come back and talk about it. In fact, let's let's go ahead and talk over this. There is sound. There's not much until we get some interviews with the players. But uh, tell us some more about this. Yeah, I mean, we had in total 120 competitors. Uh, we used the same quota as we had in Aarhus last year at the Worlds, where we only had 11 women, which um, obviously a lot of people criticized. This time we had the same quota, 90 men, 30 women, and we had both full quota. We even would have had more. Um, the problem with Lake Garda is that the, the rocks are going straight hmm. into the water, and 20 meters from the shore, it's 100 meters deep. Um, so getting the kites in the air is actually, there's not so many places, so we had very limited space. And most of the time we, we spend on actually organizing how we get them on the water. Mm. Um, I just wrote an addition to the race management manual about how to organize kiteboarding events. In the World Sailing Race Management the World management Sailing manual. Race Management Manual. And one of the key things really is uh, how to organize the launching area, how to get them on the water. Once you have them on the water, wherever the racing area is, um, it's the same sailboat racing as, as any other class. Um, but to get them there is a, is a bit tricky. You, can't, you cannot take them out of the coach boat and launch them on the water. Mm. So um, you have to put some thoughts into that. But if that works, then you get fantastic racing. And yeah, Garda is just an amazing venue. It, it, it is for any kind of racing. And I've done, I don't know how many events there, judging sailing over the years. Not not recently, unfortunately, but the Star Sailors League and some other things that are going on there. Something we probably ought to have a look at. Yeah, that was too close. That was the anchor line of the mark. Oh, that was? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Garda's yeah. great. And Gentemilia, uh, is it? You see the, I mean, we had fleets of 30 here, three, three men's fleets. And um, last, two weeks ago, we had a World Series event in, in Italy, in the south of Italy, with 80 on one start line. That, that looks quite, I mean, this looks already quite sketchy when you think about mm. that they're going 30 or 23 knots upwind, 35 downwind. Um, and the distances between the competitors um, in distance, it's a little bit more, but in seconds, it's the same close racing as as in the laser or in the 470. Mm. It's just because they go so fast. What are the sponsorship rules? You can have advertising where? Um, you can have advertising basically everywhere. Um, so the competitors, most of them are sponsored by the manufacturers. Um, it's multiple manufacturers, or so they, they have an interest in sponsoring the competitors to then sell more products to the, to the mass market. Um, and there's hardly any, there's, there's no limitation as, as in other classes. Most of the area is free for the competitor to use. There's only for uh, nationality and, and event advertising, some small reserved places. But there's a lot of commercial interests from the brands. Um, and so let, the let's listen in here for a sec. So I, I'm really happy to come in the first place here in Campione. So it's been an interesting week. So I played safe. Uh, I got two thirds, one first and one second on the finals. So really happy. I felt really fast sometimes and I had a lot of people getting really close to me sometimes. So it was interesting. And this Nico Parlier from yeah, France. He's, he's the son of a very famous French offshore sailor. Yeah. Um, so at the Sailing World Cup final, there was, there was a lot of media fuss about yes. him. 
Will he be here? Starting all uh, you will be here. Yeah. yeah, he's usually here. Now, here's somebody with it. Where, where's the St. Francis Burgie, Julia? Oh, my. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just really excited just knowing that all the hard work paid off and, um, yeah, made it another year. Um, this week was really challenging. I think it was one of the most challenging regattas that I've been to tactically. Um, obviously, we were sailing in Lake Garda, which is a really tactically significant place. And um, yeah, it was really all about sailing smart and going off the wall. Um, I had so much fun. It was so cool to see so many more girls out. Um, and I'm really excited to see how the next um, next year will be and the rest of this year. So. Yeah, I'm pretty excited. Um, I want to get the Gold Cup title um, this year, so I'll be doing the Kite Full Gold Cup this year. And uh, hopefully European title later this year. And uh, long term next year, um, you know, win more world titles and eventually go for the medal. Yeah, it was really close with Elena yesterday with the really challenging conditions and uh, yeah she's definitely still the queen and light wind she's amazing in that um and i have so much to learn on that front so i'm excited to learn more and get better at that um, okay so that's really daniela morose who's from the bay area st francis yacht club and and won the women's and you said the u.s won this first ever relay yeah this so, was, together with evan so they took that the the first race, uh, the first changeover, and Evan was over early. Oh yeah! And <laughs> on the changeover, and I thought, well, they're not going to have a great evening tonight. But then they um, then they came back and they they won with one point, um, mm. uh, the mixed one. And, and she is what, Julia? She's all of seventeen or yeah. eighteen, maybe yeah. now. Maybe she's eighteen. 18. Now, yeah. Is she yeah. eighteen? Mm -hmm. Uh, but she started when she was 14, and she was good and cute when she was 14. <laughs> yeah, well, she still is and bright and articulate. Yes, we've, absolutely. We've seen her a few times here at prize giving. Yeah, we see her at the club every now and then, but we see her prize givings. And I think she was, wasn't she Yachts Woman of the Year mm -hmm. for the club this year? So cool stuff. And she was nominated for the World Sailor of the Year. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool stuff. Well, tell us now about this chart which you sent me this morning this is what a new kite metal race format that you're experimenting with yeah there's there's a lot of discussion about formats at the moment for for all the olympic classes and uh, obviously for 2020 it's all settled um and that will be the standard racing everyone is doing the same but for 2024 everyone is asked to come up with ideas for for formats and that's not just putting a different course in or making the reach to the finish line a little bit longer um, it's about how you structure an event, how you go from a from the opening series to the finals, and um, obviously we, we have been experimenting with with a winner takes all final a couple of years ago, and also in the youth Olympics, and that's that's really not a good idea for sailing. Um, to to and, sail and the whole why? Week. I don't disagree, but why is that? Uh, it's, a, a one race winner, t which Russell Coates has been advocating for years, a one race winner take all, which yeah. is the way Star Sailors League does it too. Yeah. Um, Why is been, that not a good idea? It, it, we tested it, and from from the outcome and from the feedback, it's, it's I think we can do better. And so we came up with something where we achieve the thing that the one who's winning gold is crossing the finish line first, um, and then you get the other ranks. And I think that's important for the media to to tell a story that that then really it's it's over when the gold medalist is crossing the line as the first one in that race. And then you so put how some, do you do that if you don't do one race winner take all? Um, you when the, you go back to the this, slide. Okay, let's look at it. Take us. We have an opening series, and, and uh, how many race, teams? Twenty, uh, twenty-ish. Whatever, twenty-ish. Yep. The normal Olympic fleet. Yep. And um, to give some importance to the opening series, I mean, you're doing good the whole week. You don't want to forget for what you have been winning all the races, and then that was for nothing. Uh, you go straight to the final and you carry forward the the top two teams there the green the ones yeah. up in the green the so green if you ones. you do x many races what is it five six seven races yeah. whatever it is 10 12 whatever the <laughs> and opening series the top is. two teams then go into the finals they advance yeah. it, my right. mother would criticize me she says don't say france it sounds mom the whole world says 
France, except for the U.S., so we're going to say France in advance, if we feel like it. <laughs> so what, what do you say, Marcus? Do you say France? France. Yes, of yeah. course. Okay, so back like to your everyone. chart. <laughs> the top two teams <laughs> advance, um, advance <laughs> to the finals. Those are the green teams, and so then you have two split semis. Yeah, then there has been a lot of discussion about um, how can we make a final where we can ensure that the last one or the, the first one is winning the gold medal. And that basically everyone's coming up with a four boat final. The like like stars like stars like sailors, the Star Sailor right? League. The problem is that if you do that in the Olympics, um, then you have only four countries that are interested to watch it. Yes. So mm. that's why we need semifinals. And if you run the semifinals and the finals straight after each other, umpired and you go, you run it bang, bang, bang after each other, and then once you started watching, you keep watching until the end because it's only a couple more minutes. Um, and with this system, we keep 14 countries involved, not only the 10 that we have in the medal, se medal race at the moment, which doesn't really solve a lot. Um, and the, the winner of each semifinal goes to the final, and then uh, you keep racing with the four boats, and you do it straight in, in one go. But the finals now, it's all on one day, straight, one go. Yeah. So instead of one race, one medal race, like we have in all the other classes now for 2020, there are, it looks like here there are, what, five-ish? Yeah, uh, so in in every well, how do you how do you guarantee five, that, how do you guarantee that the boat that wins the last race wins? So the two that come from the opening series, they have they carry forward wins. The first one has two wins, the second one has one win. You got to be kidding and that's me! Like, yeah, uh, this is the Russell Coots. That is this a, is the 2017 or the 2016, 2013, 2017 America. This is the 2017 for sure. A we little bit further. Them. Okay, carry on. Much. Um, You're going to confuse the hell out of them. No, no, no. This You're is not. really good. Okay. Um, okay. You, you can, ev everyone, everyone watches tennis. Everyone understands match points, right? Yeah. So Okay, but I see it now. One. You got the first, first goes in with what, two wins? Yeah. And second place come out of those, out of the... The, the second place also comes from the opening series. He has with one, one win, win. And the others from the semifinals don't have any. And then it's first so to the win. winner, first to three. First to three. So, so you're probably so by one. giving the winner out of the preliminary series, they're more likely than not to win because they've been fast and then they they go in with a two. But man, we had the America America's Cup Defender Trials in San Diego in 1995, and we had a, a system like that. And then we decided to to go through and restart this. Everybody was so close, and there was a big big. Everybody thought we needed more racing, so he agreed to let one team go in with two wins, one with one win, and none, and one with no wins. I think is what it was, and it turned out to confuse the hell out of everybody. I was, I was uh, wrongly uh, conceived, perceived to have been the one who conceived the uh, the setup, and I wasn't. I just put it down in paper and got it, got all the teams to agree to it once they agreed, but. It, we upset people so badly you can't believe it. And and likewise, there was so much criticism in Bermuda when one of the teams, you know, had had break go, went into that final series with, uh, you know, Oracle did. Of course, they lost. They also lost. Yeah, you can still lose. But yeah. I mean, wh why why do all the work in before for for nothing in there? So we we tried this in the without the semifinals in the African Beach Games and it worked pretty well. It did. Um, we try it again in the in the next competitions, and then I mean it might not be the final format. Discussion but, just well, at started. At least you're thinking. At least you're trying and thinking. But everyone is is encouraged to do something, you know. And and I think the the main thing is that not all the ten events in the Olympics should do the same thing. Um, why not have a laser race on the last day with all the forty forty five boats? Everyone is watching. Um, why not have you know it, it has to fit to the boat. And probably the the lasers in the four seventies need a different format than the Nakras in the forty nine ers that had their stadium racing with three races stuff going on. But let, let's ask our viewers, because we have, as you know, a bunch of very bright people from literally from all over the world, or at least from Malta to Australia, where the rest of the world is sleeping right now. <laughs> and let's ask them A what they think of this format, if they think that the F Olympic finals for the 10, let's call it 10 classes, should all be the same or different in terms of format. Can we, will we confuse people more if we have different formats or should it be different formats according to the boats, which I, you know, I, I'm sympathetic to that, I think. 
But the idea of the, the Star Sailors League, and again, I'm sure we'll get a bunch of comments and questions as well. The idea that the Star Sailors League has when they put four boats into the finals and one race, winner take all, the only problem with that is that in our sport, you have people who are good in light air. Apparently, Daniela Morosa is better in heavier. No surprise, she grew up on San Francisco Bay. And you have people who are better in medium air or in light, light air, as apparently her, who's her big opponent? Elena, Elena Kalina Elena from Russia. From Russia. She sounds like she's a light. In fact, I think in that video, I'm not sure we played it all the way through, but I heard Daniela call her the light air queen. And yeah, that's, she is. <laughs> that's what she has to work on. She, Daniela, has to work. But, and the, the great thing about the old Olympic format over the long haul was that, and Julia, I mean, we've talked about this ad nauseum, you and I and others here at the bar at St. Francis, is that over seven races or six or whatever, with or without a throwout, you ended up with a different, you know, several different wind regimes usually, not always just one day of, of a blow or one day of light stuff. And if that metal race ends up being light, the lighter wizard wins. If it ends up being heavy, probably the heavier wizard wins. How do you, uh, how do you, uh, yeah. whether it's, I guess five races helps a little bit. As a sailor, it's, it's really, you want to have consistency rewarded. Um, and I think some classes should have that, do your seven races or 12 races or whatever it is, and whoever wins, wins. And you keep everyone involved until the end. Um, but it might not be the right thing for, mm. for every class. Unfortunately, the media wants to, you know, they're in 45 boats, it's, you know, whoever becomes 20th wins gold. That's, that's the media problem. But it all comes down to... But, but and, it's also a problem, it, excuse me, it's also a problem if in a 10-boat medal race, which happens a lot... I'm completely with you. They, it doesn't the, make any sense. <laughs> the 10th, the boat doesn't even have to sail. They have to sail or else they get excused. But all they have to do, a lot of times they've won it going into the medal race and it's just a... It's it's a, as we would say in Germany a wank fest. Yeah, that's that's why the current medal race doesn't solve it, and everyone is looking right. for a solution that that solves it, in a way to keep as many as countries as possible involved to for the TV numbers, um, and to make it understandable. But in the end, it all comes down whatever we choose, hmm. and I'm I'm quite convinced that we need different different formats for for different types of boats. Hmm. Offshore will de will be definitely. A different format because it's one race whoever mm. wins wins um so it's th that's already the first different thing but it all comes to the storytelling if we can explain it to the people how it works they will understand that the problem is we need to find commentators that can actually tell the story um portray the sailors behind it you know paint a picture exactly. and explain it it's, it's a lot is about presentation you can come up, up with whatever format you want if you can't explain it and if you can't bring it over from from the commentary booth to the to the spectator, then nothing will. Work. I think so. there's another problem with all this, and that is I'm a great fan of kite racing, but you can never tell who's who on on the course. And that's and, a good point. And and <coughs> you know, used to when there were five people on, and the, you knew the the, uh, the colors of the, the colors of the kites yeah. and all that it was one thing. Right now, with eighty people partying, there's no way. Now there True. are we know the technology that will let somebody show. Why haven't we moved that well, way? Well, what will you do for, specifically? What will you do for the 2024 Olympics? To we have kites that are national flags. Yeah, so identification is a problem, um, in especially in big fleets. That's why having a smaller fleet makes it easier to follow and to to see who is who. Um, for for the normal sailing World Cups and and the other big events, we'll start with flags on the. On the boards and on the helmets, which already. But when you have pictures, electronically, you can do that, and we can see it on the screen. Uh, yeah, well, we do it on the sailing they World Cup. That. We have the tracking, and we have the whole line technology that that comes from the America's Cup, mm -hmm. and that makes it much easier to understand with tracking. But for a spectator and for for the TV picture, you want to have it visual, obviously. <laughs> And um, for the 2024 Olympics, it will be fully branded kite. So the whole kite is a flag. Mm. Um, like in Rio, we mm. had um, spinnakers in full-size country mm. flags. And then it becomes easy because there's only one from each country. Um, it gets a little tricky with Poland and Monaco and Singapore because they 
they all look the same. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, we but, worked it out. Yeah. But yeah. The, you know, and that's the, that's why you have the three letter codes. More and more people understand the three letter codes, be, the Olympic code, because everyone uses them, including Sailing Illustrated. We use them. Yeah. Julie, you were going to say something else. Well, I, it, I think it is a major problem. We're trying to make heroes out of out of the athletes and and uh, build national interest, and that is the major, I think, uh, problem with it. Well, and I have a suggest back on the point of how to make the last race interesting. I have a suggestion. If there, and then we're going to go to. I put our normal slide up for comments and questions because we got so many people on here. A and a lot of people with comments and questions. We'll come to you in a sec. If if the um, goal is to get as many countries watching that last race as possible, therefore, you want all the countries in it, not just the top 10 or the top four or the tell me what. If the goal is that anybody can win in that last race, so it's who, and maybe not who wins the race, but at least you can keep track of who's where, and right now they're in 10th place, they're standing one first overall, or they're in eighth place, they're standing second, or whatever it is. The go then what we should be doing is racing everybody in six or seven or tell me how many races. No throw out, so that you have to count every race. And if you race enough races, you should need a throw out. The whole idea of throw out was that you had some bad luck in, in a shorter series. But if you're racing a lot of races, six, seven, like this, it's eight races, and you've now got, you can do a 720, you can do a 720 if you hit a mark, you can get, you have umpires out there who are telling you if you've infringed the propulsion rules, if they even apply, why not race six, seven, eight races, no throw out, count them all, and if you want to double count the last race, that's okay too, that, that would help. What do you think of that? Yeah, I, th I think that's, uh, that's something definitely worth thinking about for, for the big classes, and I think what it makes count is we should focus all our universality efforts on on the one class that has the biggest numbers, which is currently the laser. Yeah. Um, and that brings all the countries will be interested to watch that. And why not have it until the last day? You get big TV numbers, and that's I, what I, the IOC makes happy. I, I agree, and, and that's why we keep saying we keep saying I'm going to turn your camera just a little bit. And get you up higher in that frame. There we go. Uh, that's better. <laughs> but if we want to have all the countries watching, we got to have all the countries in the last race. It seems as simple as that, and we do all this other machinations and combinations and permutations. Excuse me. I'm glad to hear you, you like that. Because you're chairman. You're an influential person in world sailing. You're chairman of the classes committee, right? Yeah, well, I'm the and thing on the is council to, to, in that capacity. Yes, yes to it, it's sometimes difficult to represent the, the interests of all the classes because there sometimes there's controversial interests, but in quite a few things we we have the same opinion, and that's and when it, when it's an issue about kiteboarding, you don't vote then, right? You no. take it because you're an, an officer, you're a paid hand, you're the chief executive. And officer. basically, the the policy is that we we have in the committee is that what whatever decision is on events or equipment for the Olympics, we abstain from it. Yeah, we don't even discuss that. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, let's let's go to the phones, as they say, because there's so many people yeah, commenting on here. Appreciate the shout out to the in the lake sailing, Hanno Noel was saying, and and it is true, people. I mean, they forget even in the UK and a lot of places, the racing is on. I mean, Germany, look at there's the, the big sailing, yeah, the biggest of, sailing club in Germany is the lakes. Norddeutsche Regatta Verein on the, on the Ausen Oste in yeah. Hamburg. And, right? and the Bavarian Yacht Association has 234 members. <laughs> I mean, yacht clubs. Member clubs down Member in, clubs, in München and yeah. Munich. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. But sailing and rivers and lakes, it's nice to be on the ocean, San Diego, St. Francis here in San Francisco and so on. And even the clubs on the big lakes, like Chicago Yacht Club, but there's so much sailing that goes on in these inland lakes. And look at probably the best sailor in our country, in the in the long haul, besides Dennis Conner, who came out of San Diego, and he, he arguably is the best sailor over the long haul. But Buddy Melgus came off Lake Geneva, a little lake in Wisconsin, a superb sailor. David James is saying, Mr. Middleton 
calls him Mr. Middleton. Blake used to work for me when I ran U.S. Sailing. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Middleton. Was my coach at Stanford, small world. However, you haven't addressed the weird overlap rule. Is the overlap rule weird? David thinks we haven't addressed that. No, we did. It did? I thought we did, No, too. it's Hull yeah. only. The Hull is just Hull very short. only. The sales don't apply. Yeah. Okay. I hope that answers your question. My, is uh, not a steen, my beloved mother is watching Janice Davis, who's not in France, <laughs> but she has advanced, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, you've got to hear from her. Jody yeah. Shields is watching. Jody, okay. who was our guest on Friday. Lake Garda is the Wanji Wanji of the Northern Hemisphere. That says a lot about Wanji Wanji, which is Lake Macquarie. Again, yeah. it's a lake. They don't race. Well, they can. They can get out to the, the, the ocean. This is about two hours north. Have you been there? About two hours no, north. I haven't been there, but it was very famous in the time of the speed world record attempts with uh, Yellow Pages. Exactly. Uh, McGuire in Innovation. Exactly. Mm -hmm. God, how can I remember that? <laughs> That's a long time ago. <laughs> well, it was, but in fairly recently in the modern. Quentin Strauss, Q Strauss in the UK. Hi, Harold Bennett, famously good coach, leader of the sport. He was the race officer. Julia Harold was the race officer in that Barcelona. picture here at the gold. I'll show you after the show there in the hallway here at the Beach Street Yacht Club. I was the race committee boat representative, and Harold was the race officer for the 2010 America's Cup. And each of us had race committee boat representatives. And I went on on behalf of Oracle, of BMW Oracle Racing. And who put Her the flags up? I took the flag. <laughs> they, they were ready to start the race, story. and the race committee for the SNG Society of Nautique Genève wouldn't. Yeah. They went on strike because they thought there wasn't enough wind that was below the wind limits, which it clearly was not. And Harold said, "A, a, a few, a, a, I can't start this race. God damn it!" He had a whole line of obscenity. I said, "Harold, excuse me, I'll go take the postponement flag." He didn't have enough bodies to shoot the gun, to take the flags down, mm -hmm. to recite the line. And I said, I'll go take that flag. Do it yourself. <laughs> and that's what that big picture is ah, here at the Beach okay. Street Yacht Club of, that Harold has signed. Thank you, Harold. Uh, Peter Houston, he lost me already on this contrived metal format. So there's a friend of ours who is not particularly amused with the format. But I, 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 Peter, I to, to, uh, I think to the credit of the discussion, and particularly here to... Marcus, Marcus. I'm going to call you Marcus. No, not French, please. Marcus. <laughs> we can Marcus Hutchinson, yes. another famously good guy, longtime sailor, yeah. Irish, who lives in France. France. Mom, he lives in France. That is Marcus Hutchinson. <laughs> uh, but, but to Marcus, to your credit, I think the idea that you've got an open mind and you're not doing something for 2020. You're not using the 2020 Olympics to experiment with a new format, which is what they're doing with this offshore event. I, I'm glad you got a long runway. You can try these things, and you are trying things, and you're talking to sailors, and it's great. Uh, Lee Vershernan. What, Lee, remind us where you are. This is a pretty cool format. He likes your format. Mark Nicholas is watching. Steve Groover. I think people were upset in 95 because the format got changed during the competition. If that had been decided before the series began, it would have been more well accepted. I, I, I totally agree. I think that's a good point, Steve. Peter Houston, anything other than a winner-take-all race is something the general audience will never care about. Never underestimate the stupidity of the audience. Peter's a music producer and television guy himself. George Bunello Dupuy, rear commodore of the Royal Malta Yacht Club, is watching. Hi. We're going to have him on, Julia, right? Yes. we got to get him on. Jennifer Dunbar here, local. Jan John Sangmeister. Sango, nice to see you. Lee Vershuren is saying the Copa del... I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, Lee, too. Give me a, a phonetic pronunciation. The Copa del Rey also set up a new series scoring sale for four to five days, two races per day, which sets the ranking for the final day. Number one of the series gets one point, two gets two points. It's low point scoring for the final day. This gives the rest still a fighting chance to get on the podium. So that's similar to what you're doing. Yeah, there's a lot of possibilities, and they all need to be tested, not not at the Olympics. We need to figure that out before. Exactly. Um, but we have a couple of, of years to work it out, and we have a lot of events uh, to experiment. And then in the end, I mean, obviously, the most important is to make the sailors happy, mm. that they like it, and they find that it's a fair, uh, the right person is winning. Absolutely. That's what it's all about. And, I mean, if we can make the media happy as well, then why not? But um, we shouldn't sacrifice everything for... Well, the, the goal has to be to do both. We have to find a format that the sailors are happy with, that they're, it's, it seems real, it seems legitimate, it doesn't seem contrived, 
and that the media finds exciting. And I, I frankly, I go back, and, and J, David James is agreeing with me. I think the reason you have a regatta is so that after nine races, give or take, you have a winner. And I like the, I still like the idea. I wish you'd go push it at World Sailing. A bunch of races. Not my committee, unfortunately. Well, but, but, you, <laughs> but you represent all yeah. the classes. You should talk about it in the classes. Yeah, Ben, ben Rimoka is sitting in that uh, working party for the formats, and obviously we talk about um, a lot of things. The Emoka, yeah, sixty. No, Ben Rimoka. Oh, Ben Rimoka. Uh, ben is also coming on the show. He runs the Nacro, the Forty yeah. Nine er, and the yeah. Twenty. So he's sitting on that working party, and and there's a lot of exchange on on ideas. Vice Commodore Ken Glidewell is watching. Ken, uh, we're going to be watching at St. Francis this weekend. It's the the club is. I mean, here's a club that has been involved in the America's Cup and promotes racing at all levels and the Olympics. It, it does more to help Olympians, I think, than just about any other club, possibly New York Yacht Club, Lauderdale Yacht Club, one or two others, San Diego Yacht Club. But then also... Uh, is San Francis the, Foundation. Exactly. Yeah. And is at the, the forefront, of, great thing. forefront of the... Of, I think I might St. Francis. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Be, only because I have a committee... Properly branded today. I have a committee meeting over there today. <laughs> Uh, Mikael Gearling, Jody Shields, banging the corner style is top 10. Now they run a regatta in Australia. This is Jody Shields bang. And, and there's a website that called banging the corners. And then they have a regatta. They say that their regatta is top 10 race of them. Bottom top 10 of them race, then bottom two drop. I get it. Top 10 race, then bottom yeah. two drop new race, bottom two drop out. Keep repeating until so you get ultimately to a match. That's how shooting is doing it, by the way. Shooting the is that right? Yeah, shooting was uh, was a very confusing format, and they changed it to to exactly that. They they have an opening series basically, and then the top ten go. Everyone has two shots, and then they keep point keep adding the points, um, and then the lowest two drop out, two shots, lowest two drop out. It's simple until you have a final with. With two. And it's a match race final, and everyone said also I mean, it says, might, might have do, you, been... do, do you like that, Julia? Yes, I mean... You're not enthused. I'm, uh, You're only still reason, processing it. I'm processing it. The reason is that uh, I, I buy your original thing. With the more boats on the water, the more people watch. That's all. But, but it, it, go ahead. You were going to say something else before. Yeah, but you, you start with a lot of teams. Yes. And I mean, the thing is, usually when, when people start watching, yes. they, they keep watching. It's just no one switching on the TV if my country is not in anymore. When the country was in, then, okay, you watched it and you want to see who's winning in the end. Um, so if they were in in the beginning and get yeah. eliminated, they still want to see. Yeah. I agree. You, I you don't switch it off. So that, that's an option as well, this, the shooting thing. It just needs a lot of races. So they have another. 10 shots until they come to the final, which would equate to 10 races. But th but that also and maybe is good because then you have, let's say you have a few races to decide who gets into the final 10. And then you do this shooting, I don't know what this format, this double, this elimination, eliminate the two bottom ones. It's like a like an election in Europe. You, you do a lot of elections in Europe. The World Sailing does that way. Take a ballot, yeah. bottom person drops off. Yeah. Take another ballot, bottom person takes drops forever. Off. <laughs> takes forever, but you yeah. could do that if you had ten boats. You could do that in five races, right? Or four races. It's one race eliminates two. You got yeah. eight. Second race eliminates your six. Third race, you're down to four. Fourth race, you're down to two. Okay, yeah. But again, you can you can do it probably with a with a kite or windsurfer where you can have a ten minute race with a laser. You need to have a twenty five minute at the moment the medal race. So that makes it so for a laser, for example, I would rather have 45 and have them race all the time. Okay. But so I say, let's think about what makes sense for, for every class and do something different and, for different classes. Yeah. Depending uh, on what, what suits the boat. Well, and, and maybe that's exactly the right thing. But for sure, I like this idea because the other problem with it for the non sailors, the one thing they do understand is a match race. And that's why Star Sailors League sort of works because you got four boats. There, it's a windward lured, windward lured. There, it's a fairly quick race. You can get normally all unless they do a big split up the weather leg or down the run, which doesn't very often happen. You can almost always with the television get all four boats in the frame, in in yeah. frame or in in the shot. But match racing the other reason two boats is easy for obviously all the reasons but also the general public says match racing is the america's cup or the america's cup is match racing why don't they do that in the olympics and yeah, that gets us to that format as well and i i think there's 
I think that's it ought to be. What do you think, Julia? I th- I think it is the easiest. Pull that mic a little closer, and then I don't have to uh, write. I, write I, <laughs> uh, don't tip your tail. <laughs> 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 uh, it's a most understandable format. Yeah. So you like that? Yeah, I I think, and for me, the whole format discussion started a long time ago. And um, that, that's one of the problems as an equipment sport we're doing at the moment. We're doing 10 times the same thing with different pieces of equipment. Mm. Um, and yeah, not only to showcase the whole bandwidth of the sport, match racing would be, and I think it was amazing in London. It was easy to follow. Mm. And um, that would be a format we, we should have. But Do you know that? They tell me, and I wasn't there, but everyone who was and it was has been studying the media numbers over the longer haul say that that women's match race final in Weymouth, which was apparently the weather was good and there was breeze and it was up against the shore, was the highest watched thing. Yeah. And I can guarantee you, I, I was on the jury for two Olympics for 92 and 96 as the American member of the jury. And I also umpired because I helped invent that system, yada, yada. And so I did the, I can't remember, I did the finals of one and the semifinals of the match racing and the other because there was an American involved. And in 90. Six was in Atlanta. We're out in, you know, way out, and there wasn't much viewership. But in 92, in Barcelona, it was right in front of the Athletes' Village, the match in the match race yeah. finals, right up against the, almost against the breakwater. And all the athletes that weren't watching or weren't participating in their own events in or in other events were down on the breakwater enjoying the nice weather and watching yacht racing, and it was cool. And it was match racing. Very easy yeah. <laughs> to understand. Okay, what else do we have here, Julia? There, there, there are several Im- important. I ones. think Jody Shields has gotten us onto something there. Yeah, uh, Karen Robinson is talking about sailing can't be any more confusing than some of the velodrome event cycling events. Mm. They're confusing. Yeah, because they have heats and eliminations. And there's one where they they totter at near stop speeds and then do one lap fast. Then there's an, another where they follow <laughs> some dude on a moped for yeah. ages, and, and if that. Yes, viewers sailing must be having. Well, and Summer chance. Green says, and Summer Green's a very fine race officer and off and on. She's a, what we call a fozy, a friend of Sailing Illustrated as well. I think it's more confusing to switch scoring methods between stages. Mm-hmm. So the nice thing about the shoot, again, the shooting format or the format I was suggesting, which I, I'm warming up to the shooting format. Yeah, I don't know why we. a good idea. Can, and I think she's got a point. I think Summer's got a point. Don Logan, Lisa Ratcliffe. Lisa, thank you for your, she's sending great stuff from, I sent her a bit of, not a snarky, I just sent her a suggestion about her, some of the PR, but she's doing a great job sending stuff up from Hamilton Island Race Week, where we would all like to, have you been to Hamilton Island? No. Up in the northeast corner of Australia. That race week, and the the sailing, and the Oatley family, and the resort, and that whole thing is one of the, it's one of the bucket list items for any sailor. Should do. I Julia. Think, uh, Mark Nichols has, has an important, Point, major flaw in the olympic model yes mm-hmm. just one boat from each co- okay so let's talk about that i was going to bring that up with you as well uh let me just be sure i don't want to skip karen robertson sailing can't be any more confusing as some of the vel- yeah okay so we covered that yeah. and i think we all agree karen uh mark is saying major flaw in olympic model just one boat from each country despite some countries having more than one who are good enough to not only be in the fleet but to medal and this is a perennial problem. We know we're trying to get as many countries involved, and that's always, always been the model, at least since in the modern history. And I don't know way back, you know, back before the war, I don't know what it was like. But certainly in the time I was involved in IYU and ISAF and all the time I was aspiring to be in the Olympics, it was one person per class per country. But we know in track and field, we know in swimming, we know in – what or what you would the rest of the world calls athletics, not track and field as we do in the U.S. You can have multiple people from the same country if they qualify in whatever their qualification scheme is. Should we be doing that in sailing? Well, it depends. Um, I think the biggest issue that that we have in sailing is that we don't have enough quota for for ten events, and we are already pretty limited. For 10 events of 350 at the moment, yep. if you want to have really one universal class, yep. then more than 20 for all the other events is not really in there. And if you take the Finn, for example, where you would have probably number one, two, three, four, all from the UK, then that limits the 
yep. number of other countries that can participate. And then you get to the problem that if there's only very few places, then con countries stop trying to qualify. Um, because what's the point when there's only so few spaces? The main argument about was it always that you could do team racing and help the other yep. on the water. And unfortunately, that's happening. In I've just seen that in, in another event in the Ocean Island Games where they had up to three boats per country. And there was some, some serious team racing going on. Yeah, that, so, that is a criticism. It always has been. But by the same token, it's pretty easy to police that. If somebody is off yeah. sailing and covering that's, that's somebody what off for. on the left side of the course when they're up there to free to spring loose their their fellow teammate. But And, and to counter the other issue, I don't think even today the U.K. would put the top four. I, I'm going to play a video from the Finn from Enoshima in a moment. But I, I, they might put two Two, they might have Giles Scott and, and one or two, and the Kiwis might now have one or two, but the U.S. might even have one or two. But, you know, you got Hungary and the Netherlands and on and on and on, so I, I'm not so sure that's... And I, I personally like the idea to have more than one from, from a country. So why shouldn't it be if, let's say, France has the best top three in the world at the moment, why shouldn't they be all on yeah. the podium? Um, but it limits with the number of quota that we have. It's a really limiting uh, factor. Are there too many classes should we have fewer events classes and more boats per class serious question yeah it's a i mean at the moment we we have a pretty good uh distribution of doing doing different things and representing different types of equipment um and on the one side we want to showcase the, the whole bandwidth of the sport and apart from that argument about the double-handed mixed mixed offshore we have it now from keel boats to to kiteboarding and windsurfing mm. and everything in between. Um, as long as we, we show the bandwidth, it's, it's fine. But it's such a diverse sport. It's, it's really difficult to limit that and say we, we throw out one type of boat. Um, but the quota to, to event ratio is, is, is a serious problem. Mm. And we don't even know what quota we get for 2024. Indeed. So. Well, and one other comment I just want to put on the record again, and you know this and others do, but they say, oh, well, we, we lost 30 quota, 30 of our athletes for 2020 because of not having gender equality or not having this or that. That's not at all true. The re and I don't mean to put you here on the, under the glass there. Uh, the reason we lost 30 slots from the quota we had total for all the classes in Rio 2016 versus the, the minus 30 we've got for 2020 is because we didn't use 30 of the slots in 2016. We did not use as a sport our full allocation across the 10 events. And the IOC, who are always trying to cut back the summer games because they got too many athletes, too many sports, too much expense to put on those games, or they're trying to bolster the winter games said, okay, sailing, you didn't use 30 of your slots in 2016. You can uh, have 30 less for 2020. Yeah, which is, uh, I guess, a problem of the qualification system and when people have to commit to it. And uh, then you have countries that are really good, like New Zealand, that are not taking up the places even if they qualify. Well, and even Canada, and, and I don't think the U.S. yet, but it's under consideration. Canada qualified in certain events and didn't send athletes, and Paul Henderson's still fuming about that. <laughs> John Emmett is why. Oh, Mark Nicholas, thanks for that comment. That got a fair bit of action here. Uh, Bill Wingrove is watching. If the sailors following the scoring do not get it, then the general public watching on TV will not get it either. And I think that is also very true. Makes them more confused on top of trying to figure out the sailing. So what is gain for the TV? Good point. Uh, there seems some option for gear failure. John, if there's, you know, Hey, uh, two things. If they're gear failure, you got to be sure your gear is good. Yes, there are supplied boats, and some of them maybe are not 100%. But that's there's also all sorts of vagaries in the wind and the weather, and God knows what else. If you have enough races, hopefully it will even out. So, you know, it's the society, the modern society. Oh, well, let's give more excuses. Let's give more trophies. Let's give more throwout races. We started out, you couldn't, if you touched the mark, you were disqualified. You had to withdraw, you were disqualified. If you fouled, you had to withdraw, you were disqualified. And we gave 720. My dad, by the way, you don't know, my dad is widely credited with inventing the first 720 rule. 
Mm-hmm. So, and that's not by me, uh, by Dick Rose, who's our big rules authority here in the U.S. So the 720 rule may blame my dad for it if you don't like it, but I think it's helped sailing a lot to have some kind of an alternative penalty, right? Uh, but then you add on to that alternative penalty for touching a mark, one throw out, maybe two throw outs. And throw outs themselves make it very difficult to understand the scoring. You say, oh, well, you know, it, right now here's the standings, and then suddenly we're, we kick in throw outs after X many races. And then there are free dress on top. And uh, exactly. <laughs> and on and That's on. a big discussion. <laughs> and on and on. Uh, we got to simplify it. It's got to keep it simple, stupid, kiss. Rule. As, you, as you saw in, in Cowers with the GP50s, I yep. mean, first you have to get your boat around the course, and yep. then, then we talk about winning. So yep. Same in Formula One. Yeah. Finish first, first you got to finish. Steve Gruber, I suspect the cost per athlete is so much higher for sailing. I'm not sure that's really true. It's a little bit higher. I think we make way too much of that. I think we've got to find formats that both the sailors like and are simple. And if they're simple and understandable for sailors, and if sailors like them, then the media will like them as well. I don't think we have to invent stuff that the me- that we think the media will like. And we've been trying to do that now for, what, 25, 30 years, and I'm not sure it's a, it's worked. Have a good top-notch event that the sailors like that the sailing world likes the media will say oh we they, they really like this, this is cool uh mark nicholas uh, dilutes the fleet call okay star sailing league is by far my this is blake middleton by far my favorite system to push the winners to the top i watched the first ssl finals in nassau yep so i've watched them too but you're also another point you make and this is where guys like jody shields come in you've got to have down to earth good yacht racing commentators experienced sailors mm-hmm. like jody shields who i think is doing a terrific job for sail gp like shirley robertson who is doing yeah. a terrific job with everything she gets involved with double olympic medalist and yada yada uh wayne shrek says hello tom and julie is another fozy oh lee Versuren is in the netherlands so it is the low countries yeah. i was i was right Clark Chapin, I would amplify that. The reason to have a regatta is so that after nine or ten races, there is a winner that the competitors agree was the best sailor. You're, sh- you're shaking your yep. head. Yep. Anything else has an element of selecting the winner, winner by random choice. I couldn't agree more, Clark, and that's the problem with the medal races that are sailed after they've been sailing out in the open water, and then they move the medal race up against the Copacabana Beach or whatever that beach was in Rio and Bloody hell, everybody's complaining about the shifty conditions and the this and the that. Jeff Dreschler, hello to you. Uh, Lee Versheron says, it's good to experiment, but some committees on club level or a degree higher level try it once and never again. The L-shaped course of the America's Cup sailed at once with a yacht, never again, never seen it again. That's a good point, too. If, if the Olympic format is not something that can be easily done at the club level, I think that's a, that's another criteria that is important. Yeah, that that was a interesting consideration when we thought about the the relay format. Um, how can we make it work that every club can do it with with one boat, you mm-hmm. know, throwing some marks in the water and run it from? Mm-hmm. Yes. I mean, it must be accessible, otherwise, it will not work if just, people cannot go and train. Just explain that again in short, how that works. You start to windward. We have a start boat. Yeah. Normal start boat. Yep. You have a, either a pendant boat or or mark or whatever. Yep. You have an upwind start. Yep. And then you have a windboard mark and a leeward mark. Yep. And you get around that, and then you go basically around the pin, and you come on a reach to, to below the start boat. Like the normal Olympic courses now. Yeah. Okay. Basically, a windboard leeward course, just with a little leg in there that you come on a reach below the a start boat. A little dog leg, yeah. and you finish yeah. below the start boat. The exactly. same start boat. So the the we can do everything with one if boat I if you do want. This, so the, the starting line is like this between my and yeah. it go, going to windward, yeah. and they go up, up down, down, and then they finish on a on a line that is yeah. below that is below and perpend or yeah perpend yeah. right angles to the okay yeah. got it. So then how does the relay start? Well, you they finish yes on the on the line Where below the yep yeah. difficult. So yeah. they, they finish below yeah. the start boat, and yeah. the other one is coming from the other side. Yeah. And the one who's coming in has to cross the line first, yeah. and then the other one can go over, otherwise OCS. But they go over starting up wind as no, well? No, then they, so they, they go on the reach, and then they go up. Oh, they again. do. And after reaching, do they immediately go up wind? Yeah. 
So they don't so they go off. So they basically start at the boat. Yep. Because that's the shortest way up. And it's the windward. I see. So you've got one boat coming across the the down. The wind's coming from the top. So you got a boat here. Yep. Crossing and immediately they finish. The the teammate can cross in this direction through that same line that is parallel to the wind, and then they turn and go upwind and sail the north yeah. the same course. Okay, got it. Got it. Okay, well that helps. I'm not sure what I think of that, but it, I think it, I got it. It helps. It's basically two two laps of a windboard lowered, and it's just a the the changeover. And do you flip flop it so the women go first one race and then yeah, the we men? did one race men start, other race women start. We thought about letting it, the teams having a tactical choice. Oh, really? So that's also something up for discussion. The teams having a tactical choice, who they're, so like a relay. Who's on, starting. On athletics, you, yeah. who's, the, who's the, runs the, the, what's the first leg, and then there's the bell yeah. lap, and then there's the. I think all the other relays that are now mixed relays in the Olympics have fixed. They have fixed. That's the, the only thing you achieve is that you make it less close racing if you don't prescribe it. Yeah. They go slightly different speeds, yeah. Um, but it's something we are we are testing. So okay. Well, there's a lot of interesting ideas here. Pedro Marcos is saying I like the 3.0 format presented, your format, but I think the first should get only one win at the medal races, and second should just the direct access with no win. Okay, that's a detail, and that's an idea as well. Yeah. Ricardo Lobato saying we already have team racing and road cycling. It, it sounds like a problem. He means that's a, a problem, or is that? I don't know. There, there's a lot of new team relay, mixed relay events in, 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 in 2020 sports. and in 2022 in the winter. Okay, cool. Jeff Dreschler, hi. Blake Middleton, thanks for the great series of topics heading out. To, he's going to work on final plans for the upcoming MC National. He's a race officer up in Minnesota. It's off and on here until he has to go. They're two hours ahead of us. Interesting. Interestingly, Merritt could have been sent in 2008 games, but NED did not send her. That's Merritt. Um, her last name will come to me. Not Soderstrom. Was it Merritt? Merritt Soderstrom? So some countries have been, especially smaller, probably less affluent, although the Netherlands is very affluent. John Emmett, in 2012 and 2016, Merritt got gold and silver at the games, but they didn't send her. She qualified, but she didn't go in 2008. John Emmett's also saying it was a shame to see the 470 men's worlds decided by the OCA, OCS type. How do you do OCS on kites? If somebody's over the line Same. early, they're Same just dis disqualified. Yeah, the, the flex are uniform starts, so it's basically if you're over, you're out. You're out. But um, with the speed they're going, no one's really... So they're not standing on the line waiting for the starting signal. Um, 30 seconds before the start, they're like 400 meters away. So and two meters on the start doesn't win you win the race. So, mm. so no you're, one's pushing. If you're OCS, it. you're out. Yeah. Do they call the line tight, close, or do they? Is there a little? Gift? No, they. Are, it's pretty close, but as I said, if you go so fast and one meter, doesn't make a difference at the start. So Bill Wingrove is saying they ran the dog leg finish, which has been around for a while. I mean, that's been used in the Olympics now for three or four Olympics, if I remember well. We ran the dog leg finish at the Sunfish Midwinters at Davis Island Yacht Club, which is in Tampa, Florida, for the same reason, less boats required to run the regatta. Plus, all the boats are at the starting area, so you can turn the next start sequence quickly. Yeah. Okay, good points. Okay, uh, P.S. Benedict Horber. Benny Horber, hello to you. He's usually in Munich or in Austria or at the Gestad Yacht Club in Suiza. Good friend of mine from down that way. Uh, okay. Uh, John Emmett's, it's Marit Baumester, 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 who is the famously good. In yeah. fact, did not she win? Wasn't she on the winning Volvo boat this time? Okay. A lot of people, a lot of comments. Let's know that was, uh, Brower's. Carolyn Brower. All right. Well done. Okay. You should host the show. Yeah. <laughs> huh? You should host uh, Julia. Yeah. I got a new it, host. Yes. He should. Every time he comes to San Francisco, you should host. The show. No. When, well, when you go one way, he can do it from Berlin. Well, that's a good, good point too. <laughs> from some <laughs> random hotel room somewhere. Okay. <laughs> Just have okay. to take all this equipment with me. <laughs> Let's move on. Uh, so if you can stay for a little bit longer and see, I'm not going to force you to have any opinions, but this, laser court decision came out in the last 10 days and we finally got a hold of it yesterday posted it on the website 
And it's really not a, it, it's a preliminary, it's a procedural thing. It, it's allowing in part and denying in part, granting in part, denying in part a motion from laser performance for summary judgment. And it really narrowed the case is what it all it did, but it hasn't done much more than that. Do you have any views on Marcus on this whole late year? Again, you're well, chairman of the uh, said, I mean, there's, there's no, um, no discussion about if it should be the laser or the aero or whatever. Um, I'm just confused. <laughs> on this but do song. you agree the lasers are so widely distributed? And yeah, it's not. I mean, my personal opinion, and as I said, I, I didn't discuss it and I didn't vote on it. Um, but what the equipment committee found, and they did their job perfectly, and said this is a technically be better boat with the arrow, slightly better. And what council then did was to say, yeah, but the difference is not big enough to justify a change. And I think that's very sensible. Yeah, I, I did too, as you know. I think. The boat is so widely distributed. Okay, it's 50 years old technology, but it's still fun to sail, still looks good. And it's so widely distributed in so many countries. And if we were changed now to something, they'll sort this out, right? I'm, aren't I mean, you confident you know, if, they'll if sort another, this out? If another, if the other boat in the trials would have been like 200% better than a laser, yeah. then you, you know, it would become difficult to argue. Or, or half the price. Or half the price yeah. or whatever. I mean, half, uh, really. Well, I want to be sure my mother heard that, half the price. <laughs> <even>. <laughs> Yes. A really significant difference. Then, then you could think about it. Yeah. But for to change for change's sake is usually not a good idea. I totally agree. Okay, so that's the laser, and that's all we're going to say, Julia. That's all we're going to say about the laser because your uh, your eyes glaze over. I know. Marcus, <laughs> all of our people we've been talking about it ad yeah. nauseum. Gerardo Seeliger, you apparently you told me in the in the, before the show that you know Gerardo well. He is running for president. What do you think of that? Well, will be, it will be interesting to see who else is running. Um, Good point. So Gerardo is around for a long time, and he was standing for vice president in 2012, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, I guess a lot depends on what's happening this year on what things are going through, if if Kim still has motivation to keep doing this. <laughs> <laughs> if it's the, the current president, Kim Anderson. Let's, yeah. um, let's see. Okay. Well, I've known Gerardo forever. I think he'd be a terrific president. Uh, he speaks even, I'm sure, more languages than you do. Well, I'm not sure about that, but you told me that before the show. But he's um, he's a keen yachtsman. And as you say, however, there are other people who are going to run, no doubt. There have been four, five, six candidates in the Yeah, there, there's years. rumors. I mean, nothing, no one has, has said something so far. Yep. But I could imagine that someone from the board, uh, from the current vice president, is going for sure. it. So. At least two of them. <laughs> so one hears. Yes. So one hears. My mother says I have to stop saying that too. Well, it's a it's a clue though. It's it a, is. A, it's it, a, okay. Now let's let's go to this slide, which is let's get on to other worlds. Th those were world sailing topics, but now let's move forward to this one. And I've got the video that World Sailing released in the past few days. Uh, I, I'm not going to say any more though. Let's watch it. It's a, I, you know what it's about. Let's have a look and then discuss it afterwards. If I can get it to start. More than 70% of the globe is water. This is sailing's field of play. Offshore sailing is played out across long distances in light teasing airs and violent, roaring conditions that test any athlete's resolve. Offshore sailing is the ultimate test of a sailor's endurance, navigation and decision making. The Olympic Games is the pinnacle event for all sailors. It is where the stars of the sport come to the forefront and become household names. Paris 2024 is now embracing a major part of sailing and new heroes will be born. Offshore sailing is a ready-made, universal discipline that every World Sailing member nation can participate in. Qualification events for Paris 2024 will be held on each continent in one design boats that are already regionally available and can be accessed as charter boats. A list of equipment that can be used in offshore events will be approved by World Sailing 
and these will be used at the qualification events and available for the sailors. Boats will be equalised to ensure fair competition. Qualification will be tight, with up to 15 nations qualifying to the Olympic Games, but with every continent represented. All of the equipment approved by World Sailing for qualification events will be suitable for Paris 2024. World Sailing's Council will decide the equipment by the end of 2023, at the latest. This will ensure greater participation levels in qualification events and prevent qualified nations investing in boats and technology to gain an advantage. At the Paris 2024 Olympic Games, every boat will be supplied and will be identical to deliver a fair competition where the best all-round sailors will conquer. The mixed offshore event will comprise of three days and two nights at sea off the coast of France. Starting in Marseille, the race course and length will not be announced until close to the competition, in order that it can take advantage of the latest weather forecasts. Options will include a number of long and short courses heading towards the west and east of France. Whoever crosses the finish line first will be crowned Olympic champion. Safety and security will be provided by the French Navy and Mediterranean forces, who have a long experience of supporting major ocean sailing races. A presentation and demonstration of security and safety at sea took place at the 2019 World Cup Series final in Marseille. The mixed offshore event will be the longest and toughest of all Olympic events. Appealing to Olympic rights holders and international media, the race will capture the imagination of millions and will be the first event in the Olympic Games that can be viewed 24 hours a day. Live broadcasting, tracking and analytics direct from the boat and onboard vision will enable world sailing and global media to tell compelling stories of all the athletes and provide insight into life on board in an endurance sailing event. E-sailing has emerged as a true touchpoint for sailors and non-sailors alike to enjoy the intricacies of sailing within the confines of their home or on the go. At Paris 2024, tens of millions of sailing and Olympic sports fans will have the opportunity to compete simultaneously in the offshore event, comparing themselves to the real-life Olympians. Mixed offshore sailing will captivate and inspire millions before, during and after Paris 2024. The Olympic Games has never seen an endurance discipline such as offshore sailing and the excitement is building. Okay, there you have it. The, uh, to, to be polite, the reviews have been mixed. And I put it up on my Facebook page the other day, and I posted it on the website this month, Sailing Illustrated, this morning. And some of the comments, maybe many of the comments, perhaps most of the comments, have been caustic. I don't know if it's cognitive dissonance that people are just here, Marcus, because they know that we've been talking about this and a lot of us are concerned about the Finn class having lost or apparently lost to, to this event and other events. But I think everybody's over kiteboarding. I think everybody accepts, if not embraces kiteboarding. This event is strange though. And a lot of people have a lot of comments. What, what's your comment that <laughs> I'm abstaining. <laughs> You're abstaining. No, just in, in general to the video, um, I, I think they're quite well made, uh, well saying videos. So I agree. the only thing that I don't like about it that it's about a double handed mixed thing and most of the shots are from fully crewed boats. Yeah. But okay. Yeah, I mean you got IACC boats, you got Volvo boats, you've got okay, they've got to come up with something and I think what they're trying to say, to be fair is that this is a big part of the sport, and it is. It's half of the sport, maybe more, as people sail boats with tops, post boats with lids, and sail near shore, maybe not to Hawaii, or maybe not to Fastnet and back. But uh, big boats is a lot of the sport, and I've said all along I would hope that we might have a, some kind of a big keelboat, boat event, keelboat event, and we've lost that. We used to have 12. You know 12s used to be in the Olympics? Eight, sixes, and so on. Okay, that's a, another thing. This event is fraught 
And I, I don't know what our people, if anybody wants to get into it now, because there's a lot of problems with it. I've got one of our foes he has offered to do just to come up with the security costs. And I think when the French Olympic Organizer Committee sees, realizes what it's going to cost to secure a race course, like r four race courses. Different in Marseille. Courses, in, 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 in not, notwithstanding in Marseille, which is a dodgy place at the best of times. But it'll be safer during the Olympics. They will. They'll, the, the gendarme, they, they will, they'll tighten it up. Ralph Hewitt's watching. Li Zhu from China, their first medalist. She was the 470 gold medalist or silver? Silver or gold. First medalist in something other than a windsurfer, I think. John Emmett will help me or others will help me with that. Nice to have you on. She's also been doing CLGP commentary for the Chinese language. Lee Vershuren is saying, and we were talking about costs of lasers and equipment. Now we're talking about this offshore event. And, and while we were watching it, we were, the three of us were talking here and saying, you know, this event is, despite everyone trying to control it and everyone trying to control costs and boats being supplied, teams will spend heaps of money to try to win it. And there will be all, it's, it's just going to be really, really expensive. Chris Barnard is watching. Chris Barnard. It's early morning in, and I think that's probably where Leisure is too. Uh, it is, what, 2.30 here, so it's 6.30 in Enoshima. Are you headed to Enoshima next? Yeah, next week. When was the last time you were at home in your own bed? Um... Yeah, one and a half months. Oh gosh, you need some for, laundry. For a couple of, we have some washing only for machines. a couple of days. <laughs> we have some washing machines here in the Beach Street. <laughs> when do you leave here? Uh, Monday. Clark Chapin is saying this video seems to be trying too hard to make the event appealing. I'm reminded of a phrase about the attainable gloss level of fecal matter. <laughs> Clark, Julia, do that again, Julia. Clark, she she's scrunched up her face. Okay, so that's that. I don't know if anyone wants to say anything. I Go back and look at the comments from my Facebook, my posting the other day, and it got I got shared to, say, uh, Facebook Yacht Club and to the Sailor's Voice, and the comments are caustic for yes, the most part. Yes, And Stan Honey, by the way, somebody else who is chairman of the World Sailing Offshore Committee, has promised to come on the show. We talked to him before he and Sally took off to to, to the East Coast mm -hmm. to take their uh, yeah, and, Cal 40 yeah, up after to Newport. September, October. So he he's promised to come on and go through this. And he's very persuasive. Stan's one of the brightest, if not the brightest guys we know in the sport. And we'll see how that comes up. Okay, let's go. Since you're going to Anoshima, we've got people on who are watching in Anoshima. Just a couple other comments. Uh, Hamish Nickel, hello to you. Bill Wingrove, what if they set up a fleet of boats like they do for Con Cup and use them for several Olympics? Yeah, maybe. But then what happens, Bill, is that people will, once they know what the boat is, and that's why they're talking, you saw in that video, they're not talking about telling the class of boats until as late as possible in the quadrennium so that whoever ostensibly does it that no one finds out the boats and they don't go charter two or three or four of them. Well, everyone's going to find out what they are. Everyone's going to go charter them. Everyone's going to go pry all the top teams, the, the rich countries. And do you think this is going to be something for the island nations in Oceania or the island nations in the Caribbean? Excuse me. I see we, there was a discussion in the, at the mid-year meeting about exactly that point. And uh, uh, the thing is, as long as they do the qualification and whatever is available, yep. J70s, um, yep. whatever, Melgers 24, yep. whatever is around, and where you have fleets, um, and don't tell anyone or make no selection of what will be the Olympic boat. You have everyone qualified, however many it is, 10, 12, yep. who knows. And then you tell them, obviously, then everyone will go and buy one, at yep. least. Yep. Um, but that's only the ones that qualified, not everyone. Yeah. Um, so it... You know, it, it can work like that. Okay, but imagine, imagine that you are from a nation that doesn't have, is not a is not an affluent country. It's not Germany. It's not the U.S. It's not a country that has a big offshore tradition. A lot of people, and you do qualify by sailing in J seventies or Malgus twenty four someplace. And now you're faced with 
this arms race when everybody does launch out and get the boat or boats that are very similar and they go to the venue and they practice, practice, practice. And it's, it's fraught. Anyway, we'll get Stan Honey on here. Not, I don't go ahead. You want to say anything else? Yeah. I mean, Stan will say all these, <laughs> all these things, I guess. Yeah. Um, it's, I mean, the offshore event will have very limited number of countries qualified and, um, probably not every event has to be universal. That's what we have to laser for. And Good point. you know, even if you look at the at the Nagra Seventeen, it's not a cheap boat, mm. and you not only need one, you need some. Mm. And I think this whole discussion about the cost of the equipment is a little bit. Should we really talk about that so much when we have really most of the money goes into coaching, traveling, hotel rooms that cost way more than boats? So well, it's except a that little it's a bit barrier to entry. The cost is a well, barrier entry, entry for a lot of people at the lower level, and we keep talking about getting more people in at the bottom level, and then getting them to the intermediate level, and maybe even up the Olympic level. And if it costs, if you it, it say, "Well, I'm going to go campaign in Nacra because it," but oh my God, it costs! I don't know what a boat costs twenty five, thirty grand. What's it cost? Yeah, or more. I don't know. Or more, and I got to have to have one per year because they wear out. What? By the way, speaking of which, let's, Julie, you wanted to say something. No, I, the more I, I work around Olympic medalists, uh, the more I realize that they are really one focused and, and the trials and tribulations and money problems they all go through yeah. is just astounding. Yeah, exactly. Why, you know, why would anybody do that? Well, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and it's not only that, it's the opportunity cost of not being able to hold down a, a paying job That's or right. a, a big time pay. So you got to yeah. have what the Brits do, which is basically paying a, a, a living salary to their sailors. It's, uh, but yeah. what, let me ask Marcus, what is the cost if I wanted to be competitive here this weekend at this regatta? Just take this regatta for a weekend, uh, for, for an example. The regatta here in San Francisco, which starts when? Thursday? Um, tomorrow's registration. What day is today? Tomorrow, Tuesday. Tuesday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Thursday, yeah. Thursday. So it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or does it go on to Sunday? Sunday, yeah. So four days. And we've got the best of the best here, right? A lot, I mean, a lot of the top. Nick, yeah. Nico Parlier is yeah. here. Uh, the Heinekens, or at least Johnny is sailing, I'm sure, and a lot of the others for the South Americans and so on. And, of course, we know that... that um, our local gal, yeah, um, remind Daniela. me, Daniela, Daniela, uh, Daniela, Morose yeah, is sailing. But if I wanted to be competitive in this regatta this weekend, what would it cost me in equipment? So the the retail price of a of a foil board for kites is somewhere ten thousand, give and take. Um, but no one's paying that. So I mean, all the top guys get it for free. Yep, and. Um, they have a pretty good resale value. Yep. You have to see that if you if you say that say ten thousand round number, but you have four sales, so use any of them twenty five percent of the time. Yeah. So and that depends it, on a little depends bit, on the wind. Yeah. Obviously, when you're in the windy venue, in the light wind venue, you have to have them all, but you use them different times. So if you make a comparison to a to a normal boat, then you have a hull, a foil, and one sail, and that's up to, that adds up to five. Six, whatever retail price, but that's okay, a so little sponsorship. Ten grand, I could be competitive for ten grand. Yeah. And uh, plus transportation and room and board. Yeah. Well, the, the transportation costs you fifty dollars because you take it on the plane. You don't have to ship a container, so that's it's a huge advantage. But you have to take you know? yourself on the plane. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, if you want okay, to go somewhere, everybody does. So, so the marginal cost. If yeah. you, I mean, I, I just read the stuff about how to import a forty nine er into Australia. That's going to be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> well, and just the yeah. yeah, the back. But so the marginal cost of doing kites we know is a lot less because you can't like windsurfers. You could put the windsurfer on a plane too, and they and yeah. they did. So you didn't have to ship containers around and get carnets and uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah and you only need one. You don't need to have one in Europe, one in the Olympic venue, one at home, um, which a lot of the teams have. Mm. Mm. So okay, okay. So that's the roundabout ten grand. For uh, for yeah. somebody like me, okay. Well, maybe I should do that, Julia. Hop in, hey, get some you. equipment, yeah. and you could probably it. get used equipment for less than that. And I could be out there on Thursday. Uh, what a good idea! Not a <laughs> it might might take you one or two days longer to learn it. But <laughs> uh, Joseph Moni, they're waking up in Perth, oh, in good. Western Australia. Hi, yeah. Joseph. Uh, 
Clark Chapman saying fraught is another term for foobar. <laughs> Clark's coming up with all the racy stuff. As, yeah. as someone once said, it's not the money, it's the amount. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh. Sound and, I don't know. Are we having sound and video problems? Maybe it's your connection. Maybe it's ours. I haven't dropped any frames here. I'm looking. We're streaming at our normal rate, and everything's green here, Clark, hopefully. Hopefully it's at your, sorry, hopefully it's your and not ours. <laughs> John Emmett, I would like to suggest for NACR equipment costs are a very significant part of the campaign costs, but there are far more experienced people than me who could comment. Okay, let's look at what's going on in Enoshima. This is a video that, that World Sailing put out just before we went to air, and it's a, at the end of day four, which is Tuesday. It's now day five there. It's Wednesday morning. They're getting ready to race. But here's the latest of the latest from Enoshima, the so-called test regatta, or what they call Tokyo, ready, set, Tokyo. Steady. Steady. Ready, ready steady. See, see, I don't know who came up with that. I don't ready, know. Who, it, do you agree? It's, but it's not a sailing thing. It's for the whole test events for Tokyo. So Oh, I, they are. So it's not just it's sailing. Not, it's not sailing. <laughs> it's uh, for all. Thank God. I was going to blame World Sailing for that. I'm glad to hear <laughs> that that was... That was ready. I mean, you, the Brits would say ready, steady, go. We would say ready, set, go. So this was the Tokyo organizers that did this. Okay, it's crew talk. Okay, let's look at the video. Okay, so the medal races are coming up. To, it's today now. It's now Wednesday in Enoshima or this Olympic test event. And again, the Ready Steady Tokyo, which is the RST. We were just, Marcus was just saying, I've been looking at these videos for four days. I didn't quite put together RST on the, on the what we call pennies or what, what do you call them? Pullovers or bibs. Pi, bibs. bibs. Yeah, bibs. I would call them bibs as well. But here in the U.S., for some reason, we call them pennies which is uh, whatever. Pinafort. <laughs> is that what it's from? I think so. I don't know. So RST, Ready, Steady Tokyo, is being used by all the sports. This is not something that World Sailing came over. Thank goodness. But I like these videos. I like these yeah. short videos. We were just talking while, while we were watching that without, uh, without commentary. And you're doing the same thing in kiting? Yeah, we, we do the daily videos with captions. I mean, nowadays the community is fairly young. And everyone's watching the stuff on the train, in the car, mm. on, on the mobile phone. So you have it without sound anyway. Mm. So you have to somehow get the content across without voiceover. Good point. That is a very good point. And, or, or you're laying in bed with your partner and you There's can't. Nothing else to do. And, and, <laughs> well, or he or she's asleep and you don't want to wake them up. I mean, it's not even that you're, you know, you're not doing anything more interesting. <laughs> but okay. Now, these guys are. They've come on strong. Everyone knew they would. Everyone expected they would. And I, I think we've been saying all along, they were silver medalists in 2012. They were the gold medalists in 2016. 
They struggled a bit getting back on form. They won the Europeans, the 49er Europeans, uh, a few a couple months ago. You all know who we're talking about, and that is, of course, Blair Took and Pete Burling, the 49er European champs. And they are the America's Cup winners. They both sailed in the Volvo in the, in the around the world race and didn't win, but it looked for a while like one of them might win. But what amazingly good sailors are there two better sailors in the world today? If they defend the cup, it's going to be pretty. And if they go, if they get medals again in Tokyo, but how they're managing both campaigns, but they are. And this is a cool release. This is yachting New Zealand. They do a great job yachting. The clubs in New Zealand and Australia just do such a good job with PR for their teams. And there's, I'm getting more stuff about the New Zealand Olympic team daily. And it's cool. It's really good stuff. And this, of course, is the Yachting New Zealand press release from today as they look for their golden touch at tomorrow's, today's actually, it's now Wednesday down over there in Japan. Uh, meanwhile, the Finns put this video out, and I think they are also doing a terrific job. If anybody's looking for somebody to do the PR for a class, this guy Robert Dees, whom we've not met, who's a Brit, does a fabulous job. Have a look at this. Super hot. We had first one light, six knots, so just six to seven knots, um, which went well. Managed to win that, which was which was nice. But then uh, the second one, I felt like I dug it out and uh, got swapped on the by the fleet on the last last down when they lost a load, so got a got a 14. So uh, yeah, up and down day for me today. Bit of a shame a way to uh, lose. It's uh, it's such hard work out there. It's not um, it's hard when you're going well and. If you're working hard and not going so well, it makes it seems to make it all that much harder. So um, yeah, we'll uh, yeah, see what tomorrow brings. Yeah, I uh, had a really rough start to the week. I've been working on my starts a lot and had good starts, but wasn't able to put together the first beats and today I felt a little bit faster, just a little bit better about everything and was able to put it together and compete in the top group so it was really satisfying to finally be able to do that after six really bad races. This is my first time uh, in this venue so definitely this regatta is being looked at for me as uh, what I need to work on for the next year. For, for, for this test event and it was a super good day for me with a fifth and a first in the last race so I'm very happy. Conditions were great I think first race was a bit more tricky but second race was like 12 to 14 knots and quite stable so it was just about speed and I think I got some good speed also up and down. I think it was quite stable. Uh, there was also some okay, so you get the idea. I don't want to run through the whole thing, but so good conditions, good video produced here by our uh, friends in the Finn class, Robert Deves and co. Okay, we'll get out of that. And um, uh, there, there, but anyway. And we'll talk about the U.S. just here briefly, but the U.S. is struggling. It's not been a good test event for the U.S. There's the order of the top teams. Stu McNay and David Hughes are in the medal race for the four. Or they've got one more day, and then the 470 medal race is the day after tomorrow. Tomorrow, Wednesday. Today, Wednesday. So they're in the top ten, it looks like. Hopefully, Erica Reinecke will make it into the laser radial 
uh, uh, she is. The laser radial today? Lasers? Or no, they're also... No, it's the day after. It's, it's the day there. after. Uh, they're the day after as well. So she hopefully will do well today and stay in the hunt. After that, uh, there's a couple others on the cusp. The women, women's 49er FX, Stephanie Robel and Maggie Shea are on the cusp. Likewise, Chris Barnard and Charlie Buckingham for the laser. We'll see if they make it. Uh, Charlie has won a couple races. Good. He's won two. Sorry, not Charlie, Chris Barnard. Chris. And right. Chris was on here a minute ago. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, ben Ramacher's on here. He's waking up as well. We'll talk to you in a minute. But Chris Barnard from Newport Harbor Yacht Club, Newport Beach, has won two races. He's being coached by John Bertrand, our American John Bertrand, who's been on the show and a longtime friend. So bravo Zulu to him. We'll see if he makes it into the medal race. Right behind him is his training partner, also from Newport Beach, Charlie Buckingham. And here was the very strange paragraph, though, in the U.S., sailing release of today representing the u.s stephanie robel and maggie shea will appear in tomorrow's meaning today 49er fx medal race starting in 10th overall the four so she doesn't have a shot at meddling in other words the four remaining teams whose classes will have medal races tomorrow meaning today have concluded the regatta as of completing the final races of their qualifying series <laughs> If that, who, who wrote that sentence? If that isn't the biggest <laughs> mouthful of gobbledygook, no, no. I mean, Julia. I don't know what that means. Huh? I don't know what that means. Come on, U.S. Sailing. Come on. Josh Tozo, who's a good man, he'll, he'll tune that up. But, I mean, why don't we just say, look, we qualified one team. They, they doesn't look in the medal races that are happening today, Wednesday. And they don't really have a chance of meddling, but at least they're there. And we have, you know, or it, they've been consistently pretty good. And nobody else qualified. Okay, I mean, excuse me, let's deal with it, and then let's get on with how it's going to be better. Hopefully it will be better. Okay, enough of that. Enough. Okay, Bravo Zulu. Let's get to Bravo Zulus, because there are some Bravo Zulus. Some cool things. This gang from the Cruising Yacht Club of Australia, led by Tom Grimes. That's Tom Grimes, James Hodgson, Jeff Grimes, Jess Grimes, I guess is his brother, and Harry Hall won the Youth World Match Racing Championships. It was held in Russia. Congrats to them. We've gotten to know them through some of the other Ute match racing. <laughs> right behind them was Nick Egnot Johnson of the Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron, Kiwis All, and they were the runners-up. Congrats to them. This, this World Match Racing Championship is not nearly as good as the regattas like the Governor's Cup and the Nespresso and the Harkin that are held down under and some of the others just because there are so many good match racers in SoCal and California, but also in New Zealand and Australia. But the fact that World Sailing runs this regatta and you get one team from various countries, you get some teams that would never have a chance – uh, Matt Whitfield, for example, sailed in it, who's another guy we know well. He's the U.K. national match racing champion and a good friend. Stayed here at Beach Street Yacht Club, didn't yes. he? Yes. After an event two, a couple of years ago. But this press release, uh, it's, it's so sad because I made a note of it on our Facebook page, made fun of it, in fact, on, our, on my Facebook page. And it's no criticism of the language, the syntax, the grammar. Look, I can barely, I, I know a few words in German enough to embarrass myself with Herr <laughs> Schwentner. <laughs> I said, Guten Morgen, when he, or Guten Tag, when he walked in here. <laughs> can say Gerada Aus, which in a taxi means straight ahead, or here links, and here resh. You know, that's not bad. That's about all I can say. And, you know, I love that's you. still and, more than my Greek. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, I'm not being critical of the syntax of the grammar. What is croutonic... Croutonic <laughs> is that the first, second, third, and fourth paragraphs are talking again about the weather and the race committee. And why does our sport do this? Come on, guys. That headline should be the Cruising Yacht Club of Australia's Tom Grimes and crew and co won the X, I don't know what this is, the, the 10th. Youth Match Racing World 5th, whatever it is, 6th. Youth Match Racing World Championship, congrats to the, you know, not congrats, but just the facts, ma'am. But the lead are the names of the sailors. We're trying to make them heroes. We're trying to tell what yacht club they're from, what country they're from. 
And you finally get that in that last paragraph. And they don't even mention the name. The top of the podium gets the Australian team. I don't care about the grammar, the syntax. Gets the Australian team, which pulled ahead from the very first day and was holding the leading positions, all the others. New Zealand is on the second place. In the, okay, great. But who the hell are they? Well, there they are. I want to go back. There they are, and not naming the crews. I had to dig up the crews from other sources. We should always, 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 when we put these press releases out, include the crews. They're especially in Matt. I mean, they're always important in every kind of racing we do. Okay, maybe not on J boats when the, there's four or five people on the boat running it. There's another 50 there <laughs> riding the weather rail. You agree? Yeah. Do you do that in kiting? You always put the crews on there, right? <laughs> <laughs> Every all, time. All the, all the heavy boys on the rail. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, the name of the sailor and their country and their club, for Pete's sakes. Okay, no. Next year, that event is being run by the... Look at all the thumbs up we're getting, Julia, and yeah. the hearts and everything. Everyone right. agrees. We've got to do a better job. And people wonder why the mainstream media don't think much of our sport we've had bernie wilson on here he's the esteemed associated press writer down in san diego who still is the biggest mainstream journalist who covers the sport one of the few that still does but he does we've had talbot wilson who is a pr guy from the east coast who uh has done the bermuda race and a lot of other things the pensacola the new york yacht club son and we've had them go back and look at our shows they gave a recipe each of them did on how to do pr both from a Bernie as a journalist receiving standpoint and Talbot as a journalist from a giving it out uh, from a PR guy uh, ex exporting it or outputting it. To Those were journalists. our two uh, most popular. Two of our highest, you know, yeah. viewed shows, right? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. we've had, uh, we're going to get Robert Deves on here too and just say, how do you do this, Robert? Because he does such a good job. Yeah. We're also, we've had Josh Tozo on the show. And we have, and we're going to get him on in a more uh, a serious setting than we did the first two times we had him on the show. And we're also have had uh, any number of others who are are just you know, and uh, Andrew uh, Delves from the Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron, who is their comms officer and does a fabulous job. Come on, guys! Not all of you know that on here. No one, on, no one of our foesy, nobody watching would do that. One last Bravo Zulu. And this, just watch this video and then we'll talk about it. Here we are, the final day of the Sailing Champions League finals in San Moritz. It's been a long journey for all the teams. Congratulations to the winners, Royal Sydney Yacht Squadron from Australia. Royal Sydney Yacht Squadron is sailing Champions League winner 2019. We look forward to seeing you next year for another season of the Sailing Champions League. Okay, so that is a fairly new event. This is what, the second or third year, Marcus? Yeah, that's um, the this Champions League format is, is used by a lot of countries for their Bundesliga, like the national championship league uh, between uh, clubs. Of yacht clubs. Um, and it's very successful. Now they're the European uh, tour, same same way as in soccer and the international one. Um, they use a similar system for the finals, by the way, with a carried forward mm. points until someone has two, I think, in that mm. case. Um, and it's it's really exciting. It's, it's easy to follow, um, small fleet racing, and everyone's enjoying it, the SAP, um overlay graphics and and the whole ranking system and tracking helps obviously and live stream so, television yeah and live stream for the finals at least yeah um it's it's really good as a as a classes committee we have been working on doing this for uh for one design keel boats where all the defending skippers of the world sailing classes qualify for and hopefully we get that done in in a very similar format mm. uh, beginning of next year. Well, bravo, bravo, Zulu to everyone working on that. I several of you sent that to me this morning. Said, "Hey, Tom, you should cover that on the show." So it's a short video, which I like, a one minute video, fifty second video, whatever that was. Told the whole story. Full marks. Congrats to the Aussies, the Royal Sydney Yacht Royal Squadron. Sydney. The squadron won that. 
they were the only non-European team in the finals, and I don't know how or where they qualified. I just I don't know a lot about the event, but everybody says it's cool. Everybody, including Marcus, you're saying it's fun. So I think we should start following that, covering that a little more. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Speaking of cool events, we mentioned uh, early on about Hamilton Island Race Week, and we'll talk about it again. Mary Longpree sent a bunch of photos that are on her Facebook page, on my Facebook page. We'll put some up on the website toward the end of the week. She is down there covering it for Sailing Illustrated and just doing a bang-up job. The boat of the day, today, Tuesday, it's getting to be Wednesday there now. It is Wednesday. Bo Jest, the uh, trimaran that they bought after last year and took uh, over to Asia, Carl Kwok and his boat captain, Gavin Brady. Carl, of course, is from the Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club. And uh, without going into the details, because we report on Friday, they had a spectacular day at Hamilton Island Race Week, which, again, if you ever have the chance to go to it, if you want to do something fun, make an effort to go there. It's, I, I took the cup down there a few years ago and did a promotion prior to the 2013 America's Cup here in San Francisco. And, and I, I didn't race. I didn't have time to race. I was only there for a couple of days, but I've never had more fun at a regatta than Hamilton Island Racing and a beautiful, beautiful facility. One last video that another of you said you got to look at. And I think you should. This club is an amazing club. You probably know it, Marcus, from, on Lake Guard. Do you know this club? Have yeah. a look at Let's look at this video and see what everybody thinks. And we'll talk about it on the other side. Running out, how could you think I don't know? I've been around, but never somewhere this cold. You take away you want, but it's never, I'm never enough. I'm caught up in a fool's love. Cause I'm burning up for you and I can't let go. I feel a sky fall around me. Okay, I just I wanted you to see this because I think it is one of the coolest sailing videos I've seen in a long time. It's not all herky jerky and MTV esque cutting. Take look at this nice shot of the boats racing, nice music. Gorgeous venue. Obviously, it's the 29er, what a Europeans. And there are 420 teenagers there sailing in this regatta. Or so I'm told, from a bunch of countries. Look at the intensity. And if that doesn't inspire kids to go want to go sailing, I don't know what does, or even adults for that matter. I just think this is cool stuff. Full marks, Bravo Zulu, to the Circolo Vela Arco, which is obviously in Trentino. On the, what's that? The west side of Garda, right? Trentino. I think I'm it's, a little confused about that. <laughs> and uh, just spectacular footage. And if a 29er class, Ben Remacher, if you're watching. Bravo Zulu, and if the 29er class can do this, any class can do it. It's just fabulous stuff. Great promotion for the host venue, for the class, and for the sport. Okay, enough of all that. Let's get out of that and go to the American Cup boat race. A couple of slides. Everyone is asking me, what were these slides about? Let me back up. This slide, which first appeared, Ineos Team UK, obviously this is their Quant 28, their test boat, and it capsized, and they took a picture, and they pushed it out all over the world. And not only, and just with a 
pithy comment, you know, some, I can't remember what it said, something like, you know, some, some days at the office are better than, than others. And then this picture came out from almost like not to be outdone. This is from Prada, obviously having capsized their test boat or done something with their test boat. I'm not even sure. And another simple comment, well, you know, we've been testing and some days are better than others. Jimmy Spithill obviously giving the thumbs up there. And I don't know if it's because they're all waiting now in to get their AC-75 splashed here in the next three or four weeks. I guess all four of the big four teams are going to splash in September, maybe even yet this month. We'll see. Uh, August 9th is the first date that's hard and fast, and that's Luna Rosa, who said they're going to splash. They were going to splash on the 25th, but because of the continued problems, the delays with the foil arms, which are now delivered and apparently are okay, they say they're going to launch on the 9th of September in Cagliari, down there on in Sardinia, their team base. Okay, uh, that's the American Cup boat race. Uh, uh, this guy, speaking of cool guys, we said at the top of the show, Patrick DeBarros is going to be our guest on Friday, live via Skype from, I, I don't think Portugal. I think he's someplace else. He lives in Portugal. He's the dean of yachting in Portugal by all accounts. He's a keen racer, and he has written a book called Against the Wind, I think, A Life Sailing Against the Wind, Uma Vida Abolina. I don't speak Portuguese, but at least the English version of the book, which I am reading with enthusiasm, Patrick Montero de Barros, A Life Sailing Against the Wind, or maybe Abolina means toward the bow or upwind in Portuguese. Uh, Patrick will be our guest, and he is an outspoken, great competitor, great uh, supporter of the sport, has given a lot of money to different aspects of the sport. Uh, I used to sit with him when we were on the events committee. He and I sat because they put you uh, uh, alphabetically around the table. Do they still do that? Yeah. And the Barros, D E, sat next to Eam and E H. And I'm not kidding, at a meeting, and we didn't know each other very well, but he's a fiery Latin, and I'm, you know, I'm kind of a crude American, I guess. And he said something. We were debating the pro am stuff. And we were writing the rule, and I was on the group that was writing it, and he wanted to I, it doesn't even matter what we want. And he said something that I thought was ridiculous. I said, come on. And this was a, this was a closed mid-year meeting. It wasn't, you know, we weren't in public. And I said, Patrick, that sounds like a pilot. And I think I said probably the S word. And he stood up and he, he glowered over me and Henri Vonder out and a couple others, uh, Gerardo Sealer had to come pull him away. They thought he was going to be, you know, he's a great big, well, he's not that tall, but he's a great big buff, strong guy. And they thought, and he was, I think, joking. And I think he was like, don't talk to me that way, Tom, you know. And we've been best friends ever since. And he is a tough, hard-nosed, bright guy. And he will have plenty to say, I'm sure, about the sport in general and a few things in specific when he comes on the show on Friday. So don't miss it. Patrick DeBarros from Portugal will be live with us on Friday. Okay, let's wrap this one up. Any last-minute comments, Julia? We've overstayed our, our welcome. Well, we're over we're two hours and 15 minutes, but you know, people come and go and they can scrabble through the replay. And you look at Joe Rogan, the most popular, one of the most popular podcasts in this country. He goes on for three hours, three and a half hours sometimes. Yeah. How often do we get guys like Marcus, Marcus, yeah, who's our guest. Thank you, Marcus, for joining us. We really Thank you for having me. appreciate to have Marcus Fentner on here, who is the CEO of the International Kite Boarding, not kiting. See, I've learned something. I'm, I'm better. Kite Boarding Association. And as usual, Julia's here. Uh, ben Remacher is saying, Morning, Tom and Marcus. Just waking up here in Enoshima. Looking forward to some good finishes here. Thank you. We, ben, we love to have you on the show. We keep talking about that. John Emmett, Hung, H-U-N, Hungary, dominating the Finn test event. So not the Brits. Sound, Okay. Clark Chapin, Joan Winston, Richard Pfaff, Commodore Pfaff is yes. watching from Watch Hill, Rhode Island. Clark Chapin, as my college, <laughs> Clark, he is, he is going to be the bard, the Sailing Illustrated bard. As my college roommate used to say, when the revolution comes, we're all going to, we're going to fix all that. I think he's talking back about Steve Gruber and co. What WTF? I guess Nick is the only one that matters. Oh, Steve. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't put, you're right. And I, I should have put all the crew names on there. And if you can supply them, I'll read them off right now, but I couldn't find them. 
I, I, somebody else sent me the stuff from, uh, about the crew from the, uh, Tim, is it Tim Grimes, the Grimes crew from cruising yacht club. And if you're Steve, if you've got a, um, if you've got a relative or somebody involved in that team, I'm happy to read their names out and I'm sorry, I could not find them. And I, I started at five o'clock this morning. It's no excuse. We should always be including crew names, but I wasn't even going to put them on. I wasn't going to put the second place team on, but I had a, a picture and I know Nick Egnot Johnson, but I, and that's another thing. U S sailing is now putting names with pictures in Yay. press releases. Hooray, hooray. They're fine. I've been bugging them to do it. And they're now doing this. Finn class always does that. You do that picture, the name and the caption. So we know who the hell, otherwise we don't know who they are and people are lazy and they just send the pictures out and they don't put the names of the, the sailors in it. And for us to try to deduce who they are, is you know first of all we're we're lazy journalists are lazy the 400 boat fleet try well to find yeah them. but but it doesn't matter i'm not talking about naming everybody in a in a boat that's got you know that, that's got 15 people in it or in a 400 boat fleet of single hand i'm talking about when you put a picture up as a big picture in a press release you do that i've seen your press releases there is nico uh, nicola parlier what's his name uh nico 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 Hello. parlier and That's what we have to do. We have to. Okay. <laughs> Steve Gruber says, apparently it's a working day. Apparently two work includes two hours of watching <laughs> sailing illustrated. Like Katie Pettibone, Erica Kirby. You know, I agree with your dislike of herky jerky cutting. Thanks Jack Everett. That's why I like that video. It is possible. Oh, been there, done that, but not on the AC 75. Ibuki Koizumi. Hello, Ibuki. Koizumi son. Kevin Brown and Latchy Gilmore. So they are waking up in West at WA. Apparently, uh, presumably Latchy is in Perth, Western Australia, Royal Freshwater Bay Yacht Club, and one of the great Ute match racers and now getting on and to be an adult match racer. Okay. Marcus, anything else? No. Julia, anything else? Yes. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and and join as a patron. Share us. Give us the thumbs up. That always helps. And if you're so inclined... Go on to our website, go to sailingillustrated.com and click on the Patreon, Patreon little orange bar at the top and join us because this is member-supported media. We don't do any advertising. You see, we're not paid by anybody to mention the Kite Boarding Association or anyone else. Or not mention. Or not mention. Well, maybe there are some people who pay us not to mention. <laughs> That's a good idea. That'd be a good gig. Anyway, thank you, everybody. Join us on Patreon. Like share and subscribe the show if you're so inclined and we appreciate it very much hope to see you on the show on friday nothing or short of something earth shaking in the meantime we hope to see you friday thanks again marcus thank you julia and we'll see you on friday god internet and facebook willing in the meantime sail fast sail safe and have fun ciao bye <laughs>